It's time for Twig this week in Google. Jeff Jarvis is in studio with us. Stacey Higginbotham on the Skype. We will talk about YouTubers unionizing, the big quarterly results from the big tech companies, and an interesting new strategy for marketing the Pixel phone. It's all coming up next on Twig. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 519. Recorded Wednesday, July 31st, 2019. The Jimmy Hoffa Unboxing. This Week in Google is brought to you by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash twig. It's time for Twig This Week in Google, the show where we cover any damn thing we want. So I don't want to hear from you. We will talk about Google, but we'll also talk about Facebook, Twitter, and media. And guess who's in studio with us to talk about everything and nothing? It's <laughs> Jeff Jarvis of BuzzMachine.com. Hi, Jeff. Yay! What brings you out here? Uh, the dean and I. The dean and I visited oh, here I five years ago. She, she had too much work to do. She has oh. a real job, unlike me. So we uh, five years ago, we came, six years ago, we came out and we invented a new degree while we were out here. And she came up and she rethought television as a result. And then this time we're doing a reprise. We're visiting uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter. You Medium. built a beautiful studio in uh, at the at CUNY. We did. At the we journalism did, yeah. at J School there. Yeah. yeah. What's her name? Sarah Bartlett. Sarah, I wanted to say Sarah yes, Bartlett. Yes. yes. But then I always think, oh no, that's uh, that's uh, West Wing. But it's not. Oh, it's not. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeb's sister, Sarah. Also with us, Stacey Higginbotham Yay, from the Pacific for Stacey too. Northwest. Yay, for Stacey. I'm okay without applause. Up it's in all right. Seattle. It's great to see you. Wonderful to have you as always. It is good to be here. Um, before we start. Um, before we start. I, I, I have uh, some footage to show. Karsten Bondi, uh, our producer. Yes. Uh, uh, uh -oh. Jeff's drive up here. Oh, it's, it's, oh no! Now, yes, should we explain that Jeff does not like bridges? I he does bridges. not like bridges. Um, I don't like bridges. Yeah, we, so we have some rather dramatic. And by the way, that's PTSD from 9/11. It is. Yeah, we have some rather dramatic footage of him running away from a bridge. Uh oh. <laughs> That's you. Uh, Jeff Jarvis. Oh, Jeff. Jeff used to be the um, critic for TV Guide. Oh, my God. What happened? Now I'm very confused. Was that Howard Stern talking? Yes. And then... <laughs> so somebody is listening to Howard Stern yes. talking about... This is very meta. Talking so about Jeff. Meta. And they get you in a wreck. You didn't. You edited that, right? They get rear-ended. Uh, no, that was. We just found that. No, you're kidding me. We found that. Found Jeff, <laughs> our our Jeff. Our Jeff. Found all right, rerun. It. Let's do it again. Do it again. All right. Do it all again. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. For it. the uh, for the My audio ego for the audio this. audience, it's a ca it's in car camera. Yes. And he's listening to Howard Stern. That's the audio. And a car comes up from behind and rear ends him. Uh, Jeff Jarvis. Oh, Jeff. Jeff used to be the um, critic for... Oh, boom. I think they added the uh, car <laughs> nope. wheel squeak. Nope. No? Nope. No. Wow. Flipped him on his side. Wow. wow. I hope nobody was hurt in that uh, I, I hope so, too, horrific but, but accident. Jesus, what, I, what one causes. I bet someone was. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look good. It it's all Jeff's good. fault. The Jeez. video is from June sixteenth of this year. Does it Was say it a Model Three? Because I've been seeing all these Model Three videos getting. Oh, run all you know the time. why? Because the Model Threes have cameras the now that are always cameras. recording. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a Model Three, although it didn't look oh. like a Model Three. But it was hard, it it did hard not. to tell. No, it does not yeah, look that like a Model 3 that looks like a pickup truck yeah, is what it looks it like. It looks like a bed. So it records out the back. Yeah. So sometimes people have cameras recording, like for backup. Yeah, it's almost yeah. certainly a pickup because yeah. that's the problem with pickups. They don't have any weight in the back, and so if you get right. ta tapped, even you get tipped. Yeah, well, that's beyond the Golden Gate. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, ha no the hazards on the bridge. Tesla. Went Tesla down? wanted to take me over the. I mean, not Tesla. What am I saying? You have Tesla. Um, Google. Uh, Waze, Waze wanted to take me over the Bay Bridge, and I um, yelled at the oh. Waze lady. I said, "No, never." And, and <laughs> it <laughs> fell down in an earthquake. No. But they built it back since then. It's all new. Uh, it's better. They built, and they like used bad them. bolts. I read those stories. Yeah. <laughs> then there's that other bridge we have, the Richmond Bridge, which, which pieces falling. of chunks of it were falling off. Yeah, just earlier this year. Yeah. We can't be 
So maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe we should stay away from oh. bridges. Jesus, can I get a helicopter back to the city, please? Uh. So are YouTubers unionizing? This is a wild story from Vice. Yes. The YouTubers union is not messing around. It's joined forces with Europe's largest trade union to fight for a fairer platform, fighting for the rights of content creators, but also of users. They've joined with IG Metall, Germany's largest union, Europe's largest Which union. Which would be like YouTubers being Teamsters. <laughs> That's kind, kind of, of strange. Which is, which is a funny image, but it sure. Is. I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, when they join, do they they would totally tell where Jimmy Hoffa was buried, though. <laughs> <laughs> so. they, do, they tell, but they do a 15 minutes of video before oh, telling. Oh, well, yeah. We're gonna saying do, they were going to tell. We're going to do the Jimmy Hoffa unboxing. Yeah. <laughs> in recent years, <laughs> this is from the Vice article, in recent... Jimmy Hoffa Thank you for unboxing. that, Stacey. I like that. That was a great that was, setup. That was awesome. Like <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not usual that we'll have the title of the show in the first three minutes, but I think we actually, we actually do. In recent years, YouTube creators have consistently spoken out about changes to the massive platform. They say they're rarely consulted on that affect their ability to make money. YouTube's changed how it handles copyright takedowns. That's actually costing us money. We're not, strictly speaking, YouTube creators, but we put our shows on YouTube and we do make money on that because we count the downloads on YouTube. And so uh, we've had to make goods in the past for uh, advertisers because well, it was a month, right, that one of our shows was taken down for a month. We got it back up because it was an unfair takedown. Right. But it was, um, it was more than a month. It was 45 days. 45 it days. It was over 45 days, actually. So we that's 45 a good... days to, to respond to the thing. So that, they, yeah, that cost us money. Um, YouTube has also demonetized some uh, users. That's its chief punishment for users, it says, are uh, mm -hmm. uh, problematic. It's also issued content warnings to some innocuous channels. Uh, one of the creators leading the unionization charge, Jorg Sprav, has had his popular slingshot videos <laughs> removed by YouTube. Why, why would that be, do you imagine? I don't know. It depends what's at the other end of the slingshot, I guess. Sprav traced the origins of the problems leading to this recent move back to changes in YouTube's relationship to advertisers following the 2017 ad apocalypse. Major advertisers organized a boycott of YouTube because they didn't want their ads running next to, quote, extremist content, end quote, and claimed, uh, demanded that Google um, implement brand safety controls, which they did. But that costs a lot of content creators uh, significant ad revenue. So two years ago, Hank Green created the Internet Creators Guild. Yeah. Which was an it effort seems, to do something like that. But. You know, I, I'm all for unions. I'm a member of uh, SAG-AFTRA, right. and uh, I don't, I've don't. i always been a union uh, member. We're not a union shop, but uh, there's nothing. I have nothing against unions. But it seems kind of a slap in the face. YouTube provides free bandwidth, free publicity. I mean, it's a great free platform for content creators. I was ready to mock it. But you do think that more and more and more, and we had a conversation about this this week in San Francisco, it's not about jobs, it's about work. And in a freelance gig economy and a world of uh, Lyft and Uber, and last night I used caviar to get, while I was watching the debate, to get food brought to me, uh, there is no representation for it's independent true. people. And the gig economy hurts a lot of people. I mean, it's a very hard thing to do. I, I, I worry for our, our kids. Stacy, have you been in a, in a union? Have I? Been? Oh, no, no. I, a, I'm from Texas, and B, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have no unions in Texas. I was Texas. like, oh, we're not. But even when I was, I'm trying to think, no, even at my publications, I've never been in a union pub. That actually, that is one thing that's happening in uh, uh, web publications. Uh, yes, they are true. union. Yeah, because Fortune had half of us were, half of them were union, and people like me were not. And the print people were uh, were union, and the, and the digital yes. people were not. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there's very much in, in the sentiment in this country anti-union sentiment. Uh, is it? I bet you. Oh my though, gosh! In, yes. In the European Union, unions oh, aren't, yeah. aren't a bad, aren't a dirty word. So named well, I, because of it. <laughs> yeah. I I think what Jeff the point Jeff's making about these platforms, and maybe we don't go to the platforms, but we've historically relied on employers in our country for a social safety net, right? Mm -hmm. And that has shifted, and now we don't have a social safety net, and we don't have employers. And so we're like, okay, 
So a lot of the big debates around things like Medicare for all or universal payer or uh, things like that are because we need something. We don't have anything. And if you look at the gig economy, we're gradually dismantling even the ability of an employer to be your safety net or so, to so provide. Stacey, this is one thing that's always net. puzzled me. In the debate, the debate was going on last night in the election in the, in the, the in Democratic the Democratic candidates. candidates. Mm -hmm. Is that if I were, and I'm not, if I were a Republican company owner, you would think that I would want to get rid of the burden of having to provide health insurance to my employees. Let somebody else do it. Why should that come out of my pocket? Well, Why should I have to deal question. with all that? You know, I would think that. That is a apart from not cost. liking big government, fine. But you think that they want to offload that? I don't understand it, just logically. Um, I well, I don't know because I'm I'm pro health insurance. I for think, as am I. I think even business Lord owners, knows. even business owners, business owners understand that our health system is broken. So stockholders. So the problem is businesses, big companies who provide health insurance are beholden to stockholders, and stockholders typically want uh, providing health insurance is, it hurts the bottom line. So I think that's where that's coming from. The loyalty isn't to your employers as a business owner, it's to your shareholders. Ah, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a, but even, even then, Stacey, you're, you're spending should, you money. You should want the government to do it, right? You don't want to spend Yes. It. Well, and, and there's a lot of talk about, so if you look at something like, they, they talk about with, um, hmm, Companies like Walmart, especially low-paying companies, are the pay low wages. What's happening is taxpayers are ultimately subsidizing the high insurance rates of the uninsured that these people have. So what's happening is they're getting kind of a two-for-one in the sense that they're not insuring people, right? And they're not paying taxes. So basically the costs are coming down on municipalities and people who pay taxes into those, right. which companies do a little bit, but not as much. And maybe maybe that's why business owners aren't lobbying for a national health care. They just say, well, we're not going to pay. Yeah. And so it's up to you. We pay. We we have fairly good health insurance for our employees. It's a fairly significant cost. Mm -hmm. But I think Lisa, who I can say is, was a Republican. I don't know if she still is. Not anymore. But she's independent now. But uh, still supports single-payer health, uh, mm -hmm. government-supported mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I think, for even... For business owners, it's pretty clear that the health system isn't working. It's inefficient. Yeah. Billions oh, of dollars are going into the pockets of insurance companies, not into medical care. And here we are in what should be the country that has the best medical care in the world. And it is, we are not even in the top 20. And even as, as a business owner, even uh, I was in a fairly large company that had one or two employees who had very sick children. And the rates went kaboom. Yeah. So that you're not protected. That's part of it also, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. In fact, that's one of the burdens that we see all the time is uh, it, the very steep increases year after year after year in the health plans we provide our employees. It can get, it can, it's, we've had a couple of years where it went up, you know, double digits uh, and it, it was significant increases. And that's without anybody getting sick. I so mean, if somebody gets seriously sick in the group, then right. that's even more of a problem. So, so back to the YouTube union. I, I love the idea of a YouTube picket line where everybody's shooting everybody else on the picket <laughs> line, right? Um, uh, but that's why union, what, that's one reason on people want to unionize because that is one of the union benefits that's most cherished by people is union health care. Right, right. But, what, but the problem is a union works when you've organized the entire shop. You have to on YouTube. It's gonna the majority will be with spoilers. You couldn't even you couldn't even demand a union because you'd ha even if you had a vote. First of all, who has standing? Right. Everybody who may ever made a YouTube video who right. has standing? Right. You, this just doesn't make sense. Could it? I mean, but I don't I see any reason why to... creators couldn't join together like the Greens have tried to do and yeah, make some sort difference. of guild where they support well, each other. Well, but there's always going to be people who don't join and right. they'll be, I mean, they'll be, what is it, scabs? Is that what they are when you, when your union? Well, it's a little harsh, but yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I have I a don't... giant inflatable rat that's just waiting <laughs> to be set up outside of Twit's headquarters. I, 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 I imagine, I what, I, what, I, what I now fantasize about is the TikTok union. What's that? <laughs> well, just, just, oh, good Lord. Yeah. A bunch of, a bunch of preteens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's why the idea of unionizing YouTube doesn't completely make sense no, to me. No. And yet I do think YouTube creators have a decent case to present to YouTube. And the only way, the whole point of a union is collective bargaining, right? That mm -hmm. if every employee gets right. together and say, 
says we want some concessions from an employer, it's very difficult for the employer to ignore that. You know, you you, you have the threat of a strike, and even if you hire the Pinkertons to to beat up the strikers and bring in scabs, <laughs> it's not a good look. No. It's not a good well, look. I, I love that, too. Right, so the YouTubers are out on strike, so there, there, there come scab YouTubers yeah, they, who uh, make inferior YouTube is, videos. But that's the legitimate threat that these guys have to YouTube because, and we've always said this, when you're a YouTuber, you are working for free to benefit this giant company. Yeah. Uh, and mo we don't know. The one thing that I would, if, if I were a YouTuber, I would want to know is how, what percentage of the ad revenue am I getting? Google does not even say that. Are they taking 50% of the ad revenue? Uh, 70? Apple at least says we take 30%. But Google doesn't even say what the ad revenue is for YouTube and how much the well, YouTubers they're, get. Because they negotiate it. Yeah. And well, that's, that doesn't that's mean they couldn't where... put up a sheet for every YouTube channel and say, this is what we charge and this is what you're getting. Not a they great don't want to do position. that. No, no right, right. I understand why they don't. And that's why people form unions to get that kind of information mm -hmm. to band together and i think the most power who what it's going to take is the top 50 or 100 youtubers to get together and say yeah okay PewDiePie i, I will imagine and that pewdiepie in the fan. organizing meeting yeah yeah could they but he's an they anarchist do so it's not right. something happen. from an agency like so could there uh well that is one thing that's happening isn't it is you could come uh, through your content yeah. creation agencies yes yeah so that at least that gets them the data they need to argue for better rates and that sort of thing. And then but I mean, it does create a middleman instead of a union who's going to negotiate on your behalf. So it's collective bargaining only in the sense that if you're with a powerful enough group who can be like, oh, yeah, well, if you don't take this person, I'm not going to give you this person. Or I'm going to come down on the side of the free market here and say, if you want to be on YouTube, you know what the rules are going in. You're getting some real benefit from being on YouTube. We're happy to be on YouTube. We get free distribution. Uh, it's, I mean, it's But I think, I think the Creators Guild is a good idea where there, there becomes a body. What happened with the newspaper industry, and that's why I've been down talking to all the companies this week, uh, Google did an excellent job of involving newspaper publishers and product people in its new product for subscriptions, for example. Changed the relationship that they had uh, and uh, it, it gave them a body to talk with. And that wasn't just to fight with or even to negotiate with. It was to create a mechanism to be able to do things together. That would make sense to have a creators guild to go and talk about um, uh, uh, ethical standards for creators, uh, ethical standards for Google. Um, that would be interesting. And then I think we should have a guild of tweeters. <laughs> the guild of Facebook users. I mean, all of these uh, modern platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I don't think there's all a the content, tweeter. All the content. <laughs> well, I'm just pointing out all the content, all the way they make money. They make money by selling ads against content created for free by the users. That is inherently. But as you uh, said, they uh, get free service back, well, Stacey. Okay. So maybe you create a guild of influencers or a guild Ooh. of um, people. I mean, because there's, there's something to the idea that to to create rules around ethics and what the type of content you're going to produce, the type of messaging that you're going, you know, however you're going to behave online and how you're going to treat other people and whatnot. Um, and maybe that in influencers is bad because, you know, influencers encompass everything from Instagram people all the way to people who are like creating really cool and popular videos, but something like that does kind of make sense. And, Creating a professionalizing this category is probably smart. It's already happened in the sense that people have money. And I believe like you could actually do a lot of good for everyone who's involved in this. So think about all those stories about influencers who are like bombarding hotels with requests to like stay there for free, you know, because oh, I'm an influencer man. with X number. Oh, so it's so such think a about disgusting that. Disgusting business. It is. I just it is. And by the oh, there was a great article in Petapixel by a photographer who was talking about the lavender fields of France, uh, where the farmers have put up a sign saying, please respect our work. Don't trample the lavender. And in front of this sign, he posted, the, the author of the article posted a picture of dozens of Instagram influencers posing in the lavender so he says some people come with 12 wardrobe changes so that they can do a fashion <laughs> shoot Jesus. in the lavender, picking bunches of lavender for their Instagram shot. He said, and I, I, it's a business, charge them for it.
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, they're getting they're climbing over the fence, yes. and and uh, this is I think more and more of a blight all over the world. I know uh, our uh, photography guy on the radio show, Chris Markward, has said something about it. Trey Ratcliffe, great photographer, has actually written a book under the influence about the the he and here's a guy who really. Uh, created a career on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. and Google Plus, mm -hmm. saying this is the this is horrific. What's going on now on Instagram? Buying followers, you know, all of these would be influencers who are swamping the world. Uh, there are places uh, where they have signs, no Instagram hashtag, please. It's 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 gotten out of control. Nah. Nah. Okay, relax. <laughs> relax. I do sound like an old guy. Get off I, of my lavender, you kids. <laughs> I, I don't know if this will... I'm very curious how short-lived this is or if this is like a new profession in the sense... I mean, marketing has always been around, but like in this kind of fashion. Because I, I look at like my daughter and her friends. Some of them are very into it, but most of them are very skeptical of putting their themselves online mm -hmm. and their friends who work hard at this they're not shy about saying how much it, how hard they work at it so in it's obviously a very small group of people so i'd be curious to hear how other you know 10 year olds and 15 year olds are viewing this as a career as i mean because well, it is it's everybody hard work. you remember i mean for a while everybody said well i'm going to become an nba star i don't need to study now oh that, man, now when that, I was in the in the 90s or late 80s, I wanted to be a supermodel for a hot right. second. Uh, who wouldn't? But, As well you should have been. So Paul Rafer, uh, the photographer, wrote this in Petapixel. Photographers, Instagrammers, stop being so damn selfish and disrespectful. And here's the, here's the picture of the fields in the south of France, the lavender fields in Provence. Mm -hmm. Respect our work, please. And all the photographers trampling. <laughs> oh, into the lavender fields and of course if you do if you look for a ha you know the hashtag what did he say the hashtag was hashtag uh lavender i guess uh you will see all of these pictures you know and all of these people they damaged the land they'd stolen the owner's products they'd ruined the fields here it is yeah hashtag lavender 4.9 million hashtag lavender posts and look at these. I mean, you know, fashion shoots in the lavender. Let, let's be clear here. The problem here is bozos, not technology. Absolutely. But these oh, yeah. bozos were not as prevalent until technology empowered them. I, this is what I motives for bozo-ishness. This is what I come up with, though, every single time. You're right. Uh, that, you know, I mean, for instance, public records are stored at the county courthouse. They always have been. And if somebody wants to, they can go to the county courthouse and find out where you live. But... As soon as you added technology, databases, and the internet to this, anybody can go to a website like Spokio and find out where anybody in the world lives. And that's the problem. Technology is such a powerful tool that it can amplify bozos. And as this well kind of, as good things. As yes. well, as transparency. well, but well, this, I, I will say that this kind of platform has, at like the launch of Instagram and Snapchat, has created a an audience and an incentive to that incentivizes this behavior an audience for it and an incentive that wasn't there prior so and i, and I don't think there are people who wake up and are, are born with this desire to trample people's mm -hmm. fields and disrespect their property but i do think there are people who are maybe a little more selfish and not thinking about others um, or don't realize the impact of their actions and what happens is they draw attention, these platforms draw attention to a single place, and then you get a bunch of people who behave that same way and have that same sense of entitlement, and then voila. It's yeah, we're somewhat, negotiating norms around that. We got enough people have to have to scold the people on their right. photos and say, What did you Stop do? Stop it, knock it off. Yeah. Uh, I, and I have to say, this comes across a little bit uh, as a curmudgeonly photographer who wishes he had it to himself <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Here's a true. picture from uh, Wanaka, like Wanaka in New Zealand, that he took six years ago of a little tree that's out there in the. Uh, in the lake and he says nowadays this is what it looks like with thousands of photographers wedding photographers coming out and swamping the lake uh, and here's even one guy who decided he wanted to climb up into the tree and sit there so nobody could get that shot so uh you know <laughs> yeah he kind of wishes it were back to this you know lone tree and him 
But that's also a point of view of privilege. It's a, it's a privilege, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so let me try this out on you, since you, you both like to criticize the Valley, and, and I've been there this week. You've been in the Valley. I've been in the Valley. Um, I heard from a lot of people who, um, well, let me start here. When I lived in San Francisco, when I lived here in my day, uh, I left, I hate to admit this, in 1981, so long before Silicon Valley was Silicon Valley, um, it was a place people, San Francisco was a place people adored. They were passionate about. They loved it. They cared about it. It was a, a special place. What I've heard all this week from people in technology and elsewhere is um, nobody likes San Francisco. Everybody's fed up with San Francisco. Well, that's very sad because it was one of the great cities. It was. And it's not just San Francisco, of course. It's the whole thing. Now, when I lived there, you looked down on the peninsula, what is now Silicon Valley, and <laughs> thought did. no one would want to die being <laughs> that's there. That's the Nouveau Riche down there. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't, no, no, it wasn't the Nouveau Riche. It was, it was the American tacky. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I did a Tiki column. Tiki has his, right? I did a, yeah. a column for the Examiner once where I, 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 I surveyed, I did a census of every single fast food and junk food brand on the entirety of El Camino Real. <laughs> Uh, all Dervinia, the way up and down. Schnitzel, all of them. All of them. Carl's uh, Jr. Uh, my favorite one Wendy's. was Eat My Quiche. Eat My Quiche. Um, <laughs> and, but that was, what, that was how people envisioned the, 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 the peninsula was that it was, it strip was the strip mall that was taking over America. And, and now that strip mall is in charge of the world. And, and so it's really fascinating to me. And I also talked to a lot of people about philanthropy because we're a school and we're out here and we're going to beg for money. And people say, no, no, nobody, nobody here gives any money. No, not going to happen, no. I mean, yeah, you got Benioff, and yeah, you got Zuckerberg, but no, nobody gives any money. And somebody said to me that, that they thought that the technology-rich folk think that invest, angel investing in a company is like charity. That's our charity. Yep. And that's, that, our that's charity. their thing they're starting. We're right. funding innovation. Bingo. And so you have this, this it's worse than ennui. It's a, it's a bit of, of self-hatred springing up from the entire Bay Area, which is just so strange to me. You know, when, when I lived here, uh, you had these society uh, mockers, uh, Pat Montandon, Cyril oh, yeah. Magnon, oh, yeah. right? And they would say, darling, don't we need a symphony in San Francisco? Yeah. Let's raise money for the symphony. And then you have a huge symphony hall gets built, right? People the, used the to get money here. The old patronage system. They really did. And now that doesn't exist in San Francisco. And now people are worried patrons about... Patrons of the arts. Uh, uh, is Silicon Valley not patrons of the arts? There's no. a San Jose Symphony, no. isn't there? Hardly. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. So, so it, it is interesting to say, rose. what is the culture yeah. of not just the Valley itself, but the Valley in San Francisco and all that I have to think this now. isn't permanent. That this is just a, a, a blip. The, the go-go, you know, boom, nature of the boom... Do you ever watch Deadwood about the gold rush in South Dakota? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, those people were were really that's your kind of Gutenberg dicks. moment here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were no laws. They were, you know, it was crazy, but that was the nature of the boom. I'm sure Deadwood, South Dakota, is not lawless anymore. It's boring. It's probably fairly boring. Sure yeah. they don't have a sympathy. <laughs> but they don't <laughs> they have a sympathy. sympathy. They didn't have a sympathy then either. So, Stacy, what about since you so you went from Austin? Did Austin have a touch of that? Um, Austin was a little different because it doesn't have a lot of super rich people. So I grew up in Houston where we had huge patronage that of the arts, the right? Oil, we had the oil folks, right? The oil folks, they just give money all the time, right? Because yeah, they're guilty. Um, they're guilty. And, uh, I no. think it's an older I'm, tradition. I'm uh, I think and it's I, the George they, Bush yeah. kind of patrician tradition of patronage. Well, um, and I was going to say new money trying to impress old money. I mean, uh, Houston yes. is Houston was very much a nothing wrong with that. We are just as good as New York, or yep. God help us, Dallas. We're better than Dallas. <laughs> just as good as Dallas. <laughs> so we need our own when, TV show. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> Houston. In <an> ta <laughs> ta 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 ta. So in Austin, it was uh, for the longest time it was real estate money, and there was donations, but they weren't as big because they just didn't have quite as much money. And then when the tech guys came, Michael Dell didn't donate any money for a really long time. No, only now has Dell started donating money. He was very stingy. Um, and then other than that, there weren't a lot of startup. There were a lot of startup companies, but very few ever made it big, made it public, that sort of thing. John um, Thornton uh, is a, a Austin Oh, Ventures. my God. That man is such a friggin' jerk. But he is oh. philanthropic. Oh, Oh. He is a small-minded, oh. 
Mm -hmm. Oh my! So now that you're in Seattle, is it different there? <laughs> Seattle has a, <laughs> Seattle has a lot of public works. Uh, Paul Allen built that beautiful museum. Um, I think you know he bought uh, the well, Seahawks well, when the Gates. Se yeah, Gates, well, Gates I mean, is I having an Andrew Carnegie moment. Yes. Gates was the the rap rapacious billionaire. The uh, what did they call them? Uh, the Rockefellers and the the Carnegies. They called them the robber barons. Gates was mm -hmm. a robber baron until after he basically after he retired. Well, actually, it was when he married uh, his wife, Melinda Gates. He started giving to charity, and then he had kind of a, a moment like Andrew Carnegie, the steel baron. Who was Terry? Talk about bringing in the Pinkertons uh, to bust the union. He was famous for this. But in his later in life, I think he thought, I want to go to heaven. So he built li beautiful free public libraries all yeah. over the country. We have one in Petaluma. And I feel like Bill Gates is, is our Andrew Carnegie. He's making up for his sins. <laughs> and I think for, the, for any executive... Maybe or maybe it's just in the tech world. I don't know. But you get to a certain level. At first, you're scrapping by, and you still feel scrappy. You don't know that you're successful yeah. yet, right? Yeah. And then at that That's point right. in time, That's suddenly right. you become evil, right? I think I think what happens is you're still fighting and scrapping, and you you don't know if you're gonna make it still, even though everyone else is like, okay, buddy, you've made it. <laughs> well, look at look at Steve Jobs, who was famously stingy with charity. Mm -hmm. Apple mm -hmm. never did mm -hmm. any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, he passed away before he had a chance to have his Andrew Carnegie moment. And his his wife, his widow, is doing amazing. Laureen things with the is Collective. giving away tons of money. Bought Atlantic Magazine is not just giving away money; is also supporting for profit She's efforts that are good for journalism. society, like yeah. the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's her Emerson is, Collective, the yes. uh, that that's doing all that investing. Yeah, good for good for Laureen Jobs. She's really a remarkable person. But she doesn't see. That's the difference. Maybe that's maybe wives are are important for this equation because because men are jerks, <laughs> that's, greedy, that is the greedy, difference. selfish jerks. But, that's but, us. But neither uh, Loreen Jobs nor Melinda Gates had to scrap their way up to the top and create the company that made all that money. And so maybe they don't have that same uh, Travis Kalanick kind of mentality of I'm the underdog. I got to fight every step of the way. I don't have time for charity. Bill Gates famously said, I'm not going to give away any money until I could do it right, until I have the time yeah. to use my money wisely. And look, and, and actually, that was a pretty good maxim. Mark Zuckerberg, how much did he give uh, Newark that was just thrown away, basically, because it was inappropriate it was giving? Wonderful. It was a waste of money. I think you also have Mackenzie Bezos is already starting to be philanthropic. Yeah. Considering she yeah. has a large amount of Does money. Does Jeff Bezos have a big uh, philanthropy arm? Is there a Bezos Family Foundation? I no. think he's starting to he's invest right. in things, but <laughs> Jeff's he, Jeff's charity. This is very similar, actually. Is going to Mars. Blue, blue origin. It's going yeah. to Mars. We screwed up this planet, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do as my charity. I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to colonize Mars, so we have somewhere a plan B. He also saved the Washington Post. He, also he did the save Washington the Washington Post. Post. Yes. Okay, that's there's some credit there. Um. He launched and, a two billion dollar fund for homeless families. All right, and okay. education. So Bezos is doing good He's with doing his stuff, but, but that's, just the, that's pretty recent. And it is very I recent. think part of that is is part of this like, oh, now I need to give. It's yeah. at a certain point in time you have to give. Well, I, mean, I think this is a timely moment to mention how much money these guys are making, <laughs> 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 because it is the uh, quarterly report uh, time of year. Facebook, uh, it's uh, second. 1.5 billion daily active users in June 2019. That's an 8% increase. So all you people quitting Facebook, pfft, <laughs> you didn't make a dent. Monthly active users, 2.41 billion, also an 8% increase. But here's the number that uh, I think is important. Mobile advertising revenue, 94% of Facebook's advertising revenue came from mobile. That's up from 91%. Um, and when did they make the, uh, uh oh, we got to go mobile pitch? That was it only didn't take about them long, a couple of years, yeah. three years. I remember when, f when uh, Facebook went public, the real question on everybody's mind was, can mm -hmm. Facebook survive? <laughs> Boy, were we dumb. Can Facebook survive in a mobile world? All their revenue is desktop. 28% um, increase year over year in advertising. 
36% in other fees and payments. So they had a 28% bump in revenue. Costs went up, though, 66%. That's a pretty big jump in costs. They must be doing a lot of uh, R&D and a lot of investment. Income from operations was down as a result, 21%. Their operating margin was down from 44%. That's a nice margin to 27%, yeah. which is actually lower than Apple. And their effective tax rate, they don't mention what it was last year, <laughs> probably because it was zero. Their effective tax rate for this quarter was 46%. So that, that probably includes the $5 billion fine from the FTC. Can you count that as a tax? Um, I don't know. Uh. Let's see. Yeah. I see an asterisk. A fine? Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's an, an extraordinary expense. event. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's an includes an additional $2 billion in legal expenses related to the FTC's settlement and a $1.1 billion income tax expense due to developments in Altera Corp versus Commissioner. Wait a second. So it cost $2 billion in lawyers they to pay $5 two, billion. They spent $2 billion in legal fees. Oh, that's a great return then. <sighs> Uh, if you include Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger, their family of services, 2.1 billion daily active users. So I was down in both Menlo Park and Mountain View this last week. And the uh, last time I was at Facebook, there were building 20 was done. There's the, the old campus, and then across the street is Building 20, which is which is the one that has the famous walk on top and all that, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now Building 21 is done, and it's like doubles it, and now they're quadrupling that down the road. I think from end to end, it's gonna, it's, it looks like it's going to be at least a mile of kind of one continuous, but where they're all walking to the cafeteria all the time. Back well, that's forth, good for back you. Back and forth. That's good for you. And then down in, in, in Menlo Park, I mean, in Mountain View, the you have you seen the construction of the new Google buildings down no. there, the tents? Oh, do we have any pictures of that? Yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's just these gigantic tent-like structures uh, under which will appear buildings. They, the, the growth like of these Facebook, companies. They want to make these uh, kind of almost indoor-outdoor yeah. uh, spaces. But they're, they're just amazing, that the, the, the symbol of that. But yet, there's no branding on them anywhere. Google now has more cash than Apple. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Apple had half the cash in the go, world. Go pour it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, partly She's that's because Apple repatriated and rebought stock with it. So Apple. But Google's going to do a. Uh, nest egg is down to $102 billion. Is it, it was all the way up to 163 Is that before the stock buyback? Um, I so don't I think, know. Alphabet's it, financial reserves are now 170 Financial reserves. In other words, money in their pocket. $117 billion. That's a $20 billion increase over the last couple of years. Is that short term? Is that cash? It's that, a corporate cash liqui quish liquidity. Equivalents? Yeah, they are the top of the corporate liquidity rankings. Dang it. That's a lot. And that's even after the $8.2 billion, $8.2 billion euro fine. That's how much they've paid in the last couple of years to the EU. So, uh, Alphabet bought back 3.6 billion of stock in oh, the second quarter. So it was even after that. Um, wow. The company's it's new $25 billion buyback authorization. Yeah. So look at this sort of thing in the context of, okay, let's look at their contractors versus their employees. Look at a company like mm -hmm. Verizon or actually AT&T, which is more unionized than Verizon. And think about, you know, how that kind of, how that math ends up working. So if you look at margins and profits on at and and not that they're a wonderful company that's just not screwing anyone over anywhere, but they do have financial obligations they can't worm their way out of. And that's, it, this is shareholders that are getting this money, the stock buybacks, et cetera. Right. So Good for shareholders. So it's I interesting. Mean, Alphabet, well, Apple spent $122 billion uh, over the last 18 months buying back stock, oof. and divid including dividends. Google, $1.7 billion a quarter, much less. According to the Financial Times, in that time, Google has handed out more new shares in the form of employee stock benefits than it's bought back. Now, shareholders don't like that because that actually 
does it not help them, yeah. Cheryl. It dilutes them. Uh, but, but, but they're not using this cash to invest in They must see this as a necessary thing they, to keep their... Uh, they don't know what to do with the cash. It shows a lack of a... This is unfair, but I'll be unfair because, hey, it's only a podcast. Um, <laughs> it shows a lack of imagination. Yeah. Right? If you've I got this it, cash... I think they just have so much. I mean, that is a lot of cash. Yeah. And it's kind of this. I mean, think about it like the Bill Gates problem. They actually have a fiduciary responsibility to do something good or useful for their bottom line with it. Right. Yeah. So well, they, that's exactly what they think they're doing. Ruth Porat, the CFO, said the uh, the the increase in stock repurchase, which is uh, now 25 more billion to a stock buyback program, did not reflect any change in Alphabet's financial priorities Alphabet's two top goals, to your point, Stacy, were unchanged, to invest in the long-term growth of its existing businesses and to support acquisitions. That's one thing Google does more than Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple doesn't like acquisitions. Acquisition, and I don't blame them because acquisitions are challenging for a company. But didn't someone do a story about how Apple has been making way more acquisitions? Maybe lately. I mean... Maybe they lately. did just buy Intel's chip business for a billion That's a big dollars. one, a billion dollars. <laughs> and 2,000 Intel employees are coming over. But that's historically difficult for a company. we have I mean, if you look at the history of acquisitions in the tech sector, it's almost, it, it's almost an unbroken chain of failures yeah. and misery because it's hard to, when HP bought uh, uh, Gate... What, who was it HP bought? I've forgotten now. Uh, was it uh, Gateway? Uh, that was that big... Compact. 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 HP bought yeah. Compact. Integrating that those two teams was a nightmare and never really went very well. When Time Warner, um, so yeah. okay, well those are big. Those are those are those the are big mergers, to, yeah. big acquisitions. Tie two bricks together and they're still going to sink, kind of deals. Yeah. But you look at Apple. <laughs> Apple's doing it smart. I agree with you. They they're, like they're acquires they're, as much as anything else. Yeah, their Wikipedia page shows that they have started acquiring much many more companies in the last five years. Most of those companies are small. Um, yes. The acquisitions, uh, well, not actually. Small. They're really hiring. They're hiring great engineering teams. They're buying, yes. perhaps buying intellectual property, but they're not trying to buy companies. Is, is yeah, they're well. They actually in this last year. So there's Intel smart home business or smartphone modem business. That's a big one. Um, they bought Shazam. That not was a such big, a big deal. one. <laughs> but Beats was their they, last they big acquisition. Yeah, they million dollars. Dollars. They, huh? It was a $400 million deal. That's not insignificant. Oh, that's yeah, but how many employees did they acquire? Yeah. How many, how I don't many, know how many employees. I think they, they probably got the technology more than anything else. Yeah. And they've done a lot of semiconductor deals, believe it or not. That they've, makes sense because they're trying to build a semiconductor right. business. That's why the Intel acquisition makes sense. They're, they want to well, build their own Intel, silicon. That, that makes no sense. That that's just like a I don't that that's a weird thing. But I was going to say most of their chip deals have actually been relatively small tuck-ins with really with cool technology and what they've done is they've hired people the engineering leads for like they hired the former uh, paper master I can't think of his first name who was their head of silicon when they wanted to design their own chip. So what they've actually done is find really small chip companies that offer some, maybe it's a weird networking fabric, maybe it's an optimization scheme. And then they've actually hired someone well-known in the chip industry to pull that together with, you know, arm silicon or whatever. That's why this Intel deal is so weird and dumb. Um, it's because Intel has not done a great job with their modem business, one. So Apple buy, Apple doesn't buy technology that's bad it buys technology that's just not known yet so yeah mm. that's that's on that topic it'll be I that's know, an I interesting know, subject person. that'll be interesting to watch that because uh there were some stories that intel felt like they they that was a fire sale that a billion was not nearly enough for the thousands of patents in the 2000s who else employees. was gonna buy it but that's the problem there was no one else out yeah. there who had i mean anywhere near that kind of money and 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 only Apple, Apple, this is all about Apple getting out from under Qualcomm. And well, remember, Apple has paid a billion dollars to Qualcomm for licenses over the last couple of years. So a billion dollars to get out from under Qualcomm maybe is a bargain if they can get out from under them. That's that's the question. I think that's, is that why you're saying it's not a great acquisition? Because 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 how good was Intel's 5G modem anyway? It exactly. Seemed, seemed like it's Intel was a, struggling to make it. 
it was not a good product. So right. now what I would expect to see then is now that once Apple assesses all of this and takes a look, what I imagine will happen is it will either find something to fill in the gaps in Intel's technology. Yep. And I don't know enough about it. Which includes, uh, by the way, licenses from Qualcomm, <laughs> of all things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, or it will hire some sort of Qualcomm, per I mean, they have Qualcomm people there, but hire someone in charge of like building 5G chips that's really right. well known in the industry and bring them in. This It fits in, and maybe it is a bad acquisition, but it fits in with Apple's general uh, desire to vertically integrate the entire process hardware and software they'd like to make everything because if they make everything they've been one of the problems apple's had over the last few years is that intel has not been able to deliver with cpus or modem chips or anything else and it's held apple's product line back so stacy where's most of the fabbing done for that the intel stuff that apple bought u.s or foreign um I'm going to guess it's either TSMC or, let's it's see. In it, Taiwan. Intel's, yeah. I can um, give you a list of Intel's fab locations. I just wonder well, about, about Chandler, make, Arizona. Tariffs no, and all that. Rancho Rio. No, I'm those sorry, aren't, Rio those aren't the modem chips. Those aren't the modem chips. Oh. Those are um, the uh, CPUs. So I think the modem chips are fabulous, but I, I don't know that for okay, sure. Just, if you I'm give me curious, time, I will look it up. That, that, that would make sense. It. That's where you'd have TSMC and others. Um, right. And I can't think of the other one that I'm thinking them. of. Uh, TSMC and... Micron? No. That's memory. Um, Global Foundries? Uh, Global Foundries is the old AMD one. They don't. They do memory mostly, I think. It's SM... SM UMC? SM. Oh, UMC is the other one, and then there's an SM one. Anyway, okay, just ignore me. Ignore me. STM? <laughs> well, this is this is Infidian's old... This is Infidian stuff, Actually, so I'm trying to remember I'm, I'm where looking, Infidian I'm giving you these names from a spreadsheet of 73 rows of Intel chip foundries. Yeah. And by the way, they are all over the world. So Yeah. I know Hillsborough, Oregon is a big place for the CPUs. Mm -hmm. um, they make some in, in Israel, the microprocessors. <laughs> Um, make a lot of RAM in Singapore, the U.S., Japan. They have uh, a foundry Global in foundries, and that's, Germany. So they're all over the world. It's really interesting. Those Global Foundry Including ones China. are memory. And, yeah, yeah, I would look at the TSMCs in that place. Yeah. but Yeah, that's Taiwan. And then uh, there's a, a UMC, which is in China. Wow. France. SMIC is Beijing and Shanghai, Tianjin and Shenzhen. Uh, how did we get into this? I don't know. We, we were talking about a, Apple's we fell into a, found, a foundry hole. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, did we do Google's financials yet? I can't even remember. No. Alphabet. No, we, we oh, we started with their cash pile. Cash what we pile didn't pile. talk about is, uh, is their revenues. Um, and where, is, where have I put that? Where have I stuck that? I don't no. think that made it onto the rundown. I believe they announced their Q2 earnings. Uh, Google's, here's a story from Quartz. Google's future beyond advertising is starting to become clear. Alphabet's cash cow has always been Google, and Google's largest revenue driver has always been by far advertising. Uh, July 25th, Alphabet reported its second quarter earnings, $32.6 in revenue from Google's ad business. That's a 16% increase. But traffic acquisition costs went up also 12%. In fact, traffic acquisition costs are 22% of Google's ad revenue. Um, so that's a cause perhaps for concern. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Wall Street analyst, so I don't really, I don't know, really know what this means. The, the, uh, Revenue from ads dwarfs everything else. If you look at the, yeah. look at this so graph. What, what else are they going to do? Yeah. Other revenues is blue. Purple is ad revenue. Other revenues is tiny. And you can't well, even see other bets, <laughs> which is a tiny little sliver below that. Uh, but ad revenue is doing very, very well. It's uh, still a good uh, business for Google, right? It's still a good business, but it's not growing. So you look at that and you say, oh, yeah, is it, it kind yeah. of plateauing? And then I would also, the other thing to look at there are margins. How are the margins doing? Are they shrinking? Are they? Wall Street liked it. Their stock went up 
was bumped quite a bit, as I remember. I, uh, I think that just as uh, advertising is challenged in media, it's also challenged in the platforms. And, and the form of advertising is not forever. So I think... Well, that's Google where and, other and, bets and, and is Facebook, really important, right? Yeah, Google and Facebook are, uh, are vulnerable to... Uh, you know, the ad industry itself is suffering. Being an agency right now is no fun. Other bets, well which uh, includes Waymo, the health sciences, Verily, their internet, uh, these are all money losers. Other bets lost almost a billion dollars. That's an increase of 35%, <laughs> generating a mere $162 million in revenue. Over the last eight quarters, over the last two years, Other bets has lost $6.6 .6 billion. So I don't know what this court's headline uh, really means. It doesn't sound like anything but ads. <laughs> Are making money for pretty much uh, true. For Google, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe okay. So uh, Nest cameras, Pixel phones, yeah, their hardware is Play Store revenue not gigantic, Google Cloud but it services. is really coming up. Company posted four point two five billion for that business line, compared to six point two billion. Uh, oh, no, I'm no. sorry. Last year was four point two five billion. This year it was forty percent higher. So yes, it is coming up. Six point two billion. In, uh, mm. in its hardware division. And when they come up with a new Chromebook Pixel, services. I'm sure it'll go up another billion dollars. When are you going to do that, guys? Huh? Yeah. When? Google oh, has you missed, Was it last week? Neither of you were here last week, and we had a whole thing on Chromebooks. Of I course, because you, you had Dr. Chromebook. And the what, king and of Kevin Chromebooks. And what did Kevin uh, Toffel say? And Jason Howell loves his Chromebook, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. I, I ignore it when it comes to oh, cookbooks. I'm sorry. Stacey, I know, Jeff. I was like, oh, I knew out. enough to be like, oh, Jeff would be so excited. They were talking about LTE on Chromebooks, which I know is your thing. Here's an interesting um, change in strategy from Google. They're kind of following the OnePlus marketing model. They're starting to just talk about their phones, even though the Pixel 4 won't be out till this later this fall. Uh, they're already releasing information about the Pixel 4. Here's This is a Google blog post. As we shared last month, Pixel 4 is in the works. Today, we're giving you an early look at the technology behind two new features. I like this. I do, too. Instead of doing the Apple, oh, you can't know. It's all going to be a surprise. Google's saying, Let, let's talk about it. Maybe you'll be more interested in what we've and, got. And, and, and get some excitement built up. Motion Sense. For the past five years, the advanced technology and projects teams, ATAP, has been working on Soli, S-O-L-I. That's a motion sensor radar. We've got a miniature version at the top of the Pixel 4. It's not in a notch, by the way. The Pixel 4 will not have a notch. It's just going to have a big uh, bezel Yay! up at the top. Hallelujah. It senses small motions around the phone, combining unique software algorithms with advanced hardware sensor to recognize gestures. So so, so let's, let's figure out where this is going to go next. Because I figure that basically what's going to happen is people are going to look stupid in a whole new way. They're going to be waving at their phone to okay. skip songs. Just, just stop. We alarms, talked about this today. Silence okay, Kevin phone and I. calls. No, this is not for this is not for that. This is <laughs> what is for this everything else. Semaphore on your phone. This is for imagine yourself in front of your Google Nest Hub, whatever the heck it is, the smart display. You're w moving through your recipe that you're working on. You're moving through your songs. Oh, that's a so you good don't have idea. to say, yeah. hey, Google, do this. Oh, sorry, everyone. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and then, so so that's one. Two, think about it in your car. And so where we're going to see this, they're putting this on phones as a test. They're also doing it. I, I had said it was for economies of scale, but no one actually buys pixels. So they're just doing it to give developers access to it in a it format. It will be available in Android. So it is, a, uh, as the Pixel really should be, a reference design for what yeah. other phone manufacturers yes. might be uh, And like doing. I, when Soli first came out, I was excited about it. And I still am. This is interesting for robotic vision. So for robots, being able to like understand so the ultrasonic sensor the radar sensor that's in there gives it fine-grained understanding of movement which means it can understand where a person is in space much better than using cameras and it's not i love it look we're lo we're looking for new user interfaces voice yeah. is one yes. right gestures makes a lot of sense um shall i introduce the conspiracy theory at this point sure the other thing that will be very useful for google is it's another kind of camera. And it's, so it's not a camera. No, it's another kind of camera. It's radar. So it's what it's pulling in 
data about where a person is in space, but it's actually much less granular and fine grained than. But think a about camera. it. It can be used for identification as well. Gate. Mm -mm. One of the things Google has okay. already pioneered is gate recognition. Um, I think that Google has interests. Cameras doesn't just have to be a visual picture of what's around you. I think a radar of what's around you might be of equal interest to Google. And the more sensors they have on that phone, the better they can gather information. They also say they're going to add face unlock, which, of course, Apple pioneered here. Uh, they say the Pixel 4 will proactively unlock faces even if you don't lift your phone. Uh, if the face unlock sensors and algorithms recognize you, the phone will open the minute you pick it up. It's already recognized you. It just hasn't unlocked until you tell the phone, I want to use you. Face unlock works in almost any orientation, even if it's upside down. And you can use it for secure payments and app authentication, too. This is a little bit of let's do what Apple's So doing. Benedict Evans, who's a brilliant analyst at um, Andreessen Horowitz, wrote a piece. I just put it in the rundown um, this month. Arguing that uh, about uh, talking about computers that can see, yeah. that how a huge number of cameras that are being produced are not produced to make anything for us human beings to I look agree. at. Right? I agree. Right? Yes, think he's right. And, and that and that that's where the notion of vision uh, goes. It's 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 a lot of Stacy's world, right, Stacy? Yes, and I've uh, in the last two or three years, I think I've written his article several times. Yeah. Um, but yes, and this type of technology, I know just a couple. Probably a few months ago, I wrote about radar and Project Soli and other sensor efforts that use radar. This is going to be super popular for aging in place. People are already using it to measure falls. Um, there's a, so good, yes, there's there's, a good use. Yeah. Yep. There's the conspiracy theory. Yes. But this is for most people way less intrusive because and, and this has always been the case. People worry about images of themselves that are viewable by other people online and searchable, right? We worry about cameras for that reason. People don't think about metadata that can equally understand that when a computer knows that, you know, I am doing something embarrassing, it doesn't bother me because it's a computer. As long as the computer and people don't think about the fact that the computer can say, oh, these these engage these particular this set of metadata means Stacy's picking her nose right now. You know, as long as that's not visually out there on the internet, I don't care. What the happens in Intel stays at in Intel. Yeah. So, yeah, but so I would submit that that's a typical human centric point of view, but yes. not a very right. informed point of Which view. Which is what Stacey said. It's saying. not, yeah. but that's what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. that people think that's great, but right. what's really happening is that made it metadata about my falls or my me picking my nose or whatever. That is going to be turned into Stacey picks her nose. Right. Let's market her some. I don't know what products nose pickers have, um, but so well. The it's also still face recognition. Out there. Radar uh, makes. In fact, Apple has basically that kind of three D sensing built into its iPhone Face ID. Face recognition with a two D still image isn't as good as three D no, images. They, they don't use radar. They don't. They use, they use a, depth do they sensing. Use a, they use the, yeah. They, is it a time of flight depth sensor? Time of light. Time of, time of flight. It is not. Time of flight. No, what is, like LiDAR. What, what type of... It's not, it's not LiDAR. There are three... It's the same thing there's, as, no, it's not LiDAR because they're thinking of they adding bought, LiDAR in 2020. Apple bought an Israeli company called PrimeSense that developed this initially for Microsoft's Connect. It, uh, the Connect... Right. And it's the same technology in the Apple iPhone, I should point out, can tell your heart rate. Right. So with the Connect, for instance, when you're exercising... It, it, they, they've taken Microsoft stopped selling them for reason I don't fully understand. But there understand. are three different they technologies. They can tell if you're exercising depth. hard enough because your heart rate at distance is not fast enough. This this kind of technology is very useful. Um, yes, but I, my quibble with you is there are three different types of technologies no, that allow for depth it's perception. Not radar. And radar is yeah. one of them, but yeah. I don't think that's the one that Apple's using. Sorry. No, but mine is. I'm arguing with you on a purely tech basis. So <laughs> Apple. And in fact, Apple even demonstrated this when they introduced Face ID. Shell sends out an infrared light, which they bounce off your face, which detects the contours of your face. So it's not technically time of flight, but it's very similar to that right. kind of. Well, so, uh, so three well, time, of, Google time of flight is, is uses math. Google's face uh, recognition is supposed to be different. The story is about right, it said because that. they didn't have the patent. <laughs> but, but it's supposed to be Apple better. Apple owns Prime Sense. How does it? Well, that's they just have to do something different.
Because they're so, saying you don't even have to pick it up to your face. They can do it from different angles and upside down. Yeah, and this was, uh, you know, Apple has had struggled a little bit when it first came out with Face ID at, at doing it at different, you know, and if it's the cameras rotated. I'm uh, dreading But they have that. They've mastered that. That It does it now. I'm dreading it. Well, I'm just, I want to point out that it's, you know, there's some value to it uh, for unlocking or sensing or gestures, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be, and, and you know, the, you got to remember how Google thinks about this. They don't go, they're not rubbing their hands gleefully saying, and while we're doing that, we can also sense your heart rate and all these other things. They think of this all as a general benefit. We will know more about you and we can deliver more services as a result. But I should point out, as you have, Stacy, that it is much more information than a 2D picture can give you. Uh, and and can be used in a variety of ways, and we don't yet know what kinds of ways. Uh, Google did point out that just like Apple, they're going to store all that face recognition in a secure enclave chip within the Pixel Four, so it won't be sent right. It to will be Google. local, yeah, which is exciting. Local. Yeah, so that's good news. What is <laughs> important also to point out, and we always point this out with Apple, is they may store the raw data of your fingerprint or your face id on the phone and never ex never send it to apple but they they absolutely send out the processed information later mm -hmm. that they know so and they and they even admit to this yeah we don't have your fingerprint but we know <laughs> we know the the information that that generates and i think that google would do the same thing uh for a variety of, of reasons oh here i found a paper for the super nerds, I'm going to put it in the chat. Here is the SIGGRAPH paper from 2017 on how Soli works. Oh, cool. There you go. Thank you. Um, and I am reading it right now to figure this out. Well, you, um, but it's all right. We, you don't have to do it right now. I have to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm like, this is, this is how I know this stuff. I read lots of papers. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. Um, oh, how many, it's, yeah, Stacey, it's using let me ask 60 you about that for a second. How it's, many um, do you have to subscribe to a lot of academic journal uh, I subscribe databases? to no, no academic journals. What I do is I pay attention for like Hot Chips or SIGGRAPH, which just happened. Um, and a lot of companies, if I talk to them, they'll just send me the papers, mm -hmm. their white papers. Because, I mean, it's really rare that they're interviewing a journalist and the journalist gets so excited about what they're doing that they're like, can I see your white paper? Can I see your research? And then I go on archive, which is like my favorite place ever. But that's for AI research more than chip research. Got it. Uh, let's see. Google is stopping people on the street and giving them $5. Just relax. Just relax. <laughs> it's okay. They it's are, fine. this is, they say to perfect their Pixel 4 Face ID feature because, of course, you need the data mm -hmm. before you can make Face ID work reliably. Google has has said that. Uh, it was initially reported by uh, Chris uh, Matizic in uh, ZDNet. Uh, he said, uh, he, I think he was in Washington Square Park in the city. Hi, I work for Google, somebody said, and we're collecting data to improve the next generation of face recognition, of facial recognition phone unlocking. You need to hold the phone in selfie mode in front of your face, moving it around to analyze every feature of your appearance, and then we'll give you a five dollar Amazon or Starbucks gift card. So it's they're disclosing it's fine. Yeah. They're saying what's what. It's yeah, right. and they and companies need to do this. Yeah. yeah, they could they could do it surreptitiously. They could just put a camera out and do it. But well, that wouldn't get them the, the measurements they need. <laughs> well, five or six cameras. Yeah. Well, here's what they could do: they could put out an app saying. Hey, yes. if you scan your face for us, we'll send you. We'll tell you what you look Gee, like when you'll be twenty. Who would ever do something. that? <laughs> Google or says, Google, although Google did this with their um, art thing. Yeah, remember that? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Microsoft's done it too. But Microsoft did the aging thing. When it comes to the data the company's already gathered from the compensated volunteers, Google is allowing them to decide what ultimately happens to it. Although face samples inherently can't be anonymous, says Google, each participant is assigned an abstract identity number. We separately keep each participant's email address in order to remove data upon request. That's a, probably a GDPR requirement. Participants previously agreed to allow Doodle, do, Google to keep... They should call themselves Doodle. Google to keep their face data for five years. Now they're cutting it down after the, uh, after the publicity to 18 months. Once they've analyzed, sufficient. they don't need it. Yeah, they don't need it. The Pixel 4 will not send your data to Google for its face recognition to work. 
should reiterate that. Good, you're calm today. This is good. I'm always calm. I think I is it weird? Maybe Jeff has a calming influence on you. <laughs> I'm always uh, I'm not any different than I always am. Or do you have a calming influence on Jeff? Exactly the same. Even Jeff seems calm. You just wait. <laughs> let's talk about All section right. 203. No. <laughs> yeah, let's not let's not rev him up. Actually, let's talk about Let's talk Don't get about me going. Let's talk about the quality. Oh, medium is down. Well, I'll have to I'll have to talk to the author about what's wrong with tech journalism. So there was is it down? Uh, there was a very good paper that I saw presented at an academic conference in Medium. Yeah, it's, oh no, 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 no it came no. back up. Okay, okay. Uh, by Axel Bruns, who's an academic at the University of Queensland, and um, he pokes holes, rather considerable, gigantic wormhole holes in the notions and metaphors of the, um, it's on Buzz Machine. Okay. You know, Your blog is never down. Uh, don't jinx me. Uh, in the idea of the filter bubble and the echo chamber. And, 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 and does a very good literature read going through all the literature that says, folks, it doesn't really exist, but these metaphors are being used. And the metaphors are, Ill, are not at all defined. So we don't have any, any mechanism to argue about it or measure it or understand what this impact is. So define, before we go too much farther, what is commonly believed to be the echo chamber in the filter bubble? They Eli become, they become almost the, synonymous. Eli Pariser used the term Eli, Eli Pariser argued that the filter bubble is that if you went into search and that you and I would get uh, uh, Because searches. search is, and the way Google does it anyway, is modified based on your previous searches, you're going to tend to get eventually over time the same results that was the argument though yeah. though, uh, though axel bruns points to research that says that wasn't the case except for within a nation you had similar uh, uh search results but but with you a, and I maybe even within a zip code no 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 no, no. it has to so be we, as big we, as a nation we, yeah that, that there you have different languages and so on so you have different search but but in, in in google search and google news this research showed uh because it's actual research so so this sent me on to an argument uh, and I'm a fake academic. I am no academic. I'm just a journalism teacher. But uh, among the real ac academics who are doing the kind of papers that, that Stacy reads uh, that really matter, there's a standard and discipline of evidence. And we don't have that in journalism. And I'm, oh, so I, I end up ranting about the quality of technology journalism. It went from full utopian to full dystopian. And things like echo chamber and filter bubble uh, bubble up to become just presumed this exists right. without any effort to even do a literature search and see what exists in the evidence. And then re regulation and legislation is going to pop out of that. And we're just irresponsible in my field. So I complained about that. I thought I'd get a lot of crap from people like you, but so far I haven't. Uh, and, and, and I think we have a problem in the, in the tech journalism world uh, that we haven't really, really dealt with, but it's not just tech journalism. It's all of journalism. It's, right? it's humans. Um, well, okay, we, should, because, we should be better. That's because, Humans, yeah, need no, better journalism, of course. No, no, it's okay. We have to, like, more data is always good, but the challenge with journalism, and you can call it a filter bubble, you can call it whatever you want, is we are writing stories for people. And people are story and narrative oriented. And Jeff, you have some book, some academic book that talks about this. Um Yes, the, uh, how history gets things wrong, the neuroscience yes. of our addiction to stories. Yes, but that. that, that Stacey, that doesn't mean the story has to be factless. I, but people, journalists do look for facts. We just look for facts in the context in which we have today, which may be, which is driven by a narrative. I mean, how do you find your stories? I tell you how, I mean, I find my stories because people talk to me about things they've noticed. But I They're know, like, hey, Stacey, I know that you, you because you're that. a good journalist and responsible journalist, attempt to escape the confines of your preconceived notions when you're doing research for your stories. And you have context. I do, you, and that's... You, you do it on the show, Stacey. You bring in context, as you just did to Leo three minutes ago. Yeah. So no, 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 no right. you're getting all that wrong because you have the experience and the context. But, okay, but here... And I, you're right. I've done this. This is why I talk to engineers more than I talk to people. Or okay, that well, was wrong. They're, they're going to love uh, like, hearing that say, that construct. Sorry, yeah. PR PR people is really I like like normal people, people who don't look at data, and that's you're, why. You're, I, uh, keep digging, Stacy. Keep I digging. I'm, I am more like that than an actual person, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the point is, engineers are my people because we think alike. We think in data, but I will tell you, as a journalist. 
fewer people read my stories because I don't have the narrative and I'm not very good at it. And that is the challenge. And I always call it the dead baby lead because you lead with a dead baby to get your story, you know, out there. And Sarah Kiff is actually really good at this. She does healthcare data, for example, but she will always, all of her stories are super immersed in data, but they always have, they don't always have an actual dead baby, but they have some sort of, usually it's a dying patient of some sort. Um, And, but that type of journalism is really rare. It's really hard. It's really expensive. And people don't, I mean, and Honestly, I don't think it actually drives page views, which is well, the let, advertising. Let me argue metric. with you, Stacey, because I think I think I think Leo's point is right. You're not giving yourself sufficient credit for the good job that you do in journalism. Um, what I'm talking about here is that you come. I mean, look, look at the look at the red wine will kill you, red wine will save you stories. Right. That's an example about how we just don't simply just understand and report on science the way it should be reported on. That there are strings of 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 of, of bits of research that test out various. Um, hypotheses and that add up to something, but the story doesn't add up to it. Or when we say, when there's this presumption that there's a filter bubble and it's never tested, that you do stories about, oh my God, we're all in a filter bubble. We're all, this, is, this is the roots of all of our problems in society right now. And then you have academic research at easy reach to just do a simple search to say, uh, uh-oh, actually, no. The filter bubble's been debunked, but it's been debunked in a different role of the academe. So uh, I would and, say- and that's the problem. One- when people start talking about the filter bubble, we've been talking about the filter bubble before there was academic research about it. So people start estimating that this is out there. If you're actually at the cutting edge, people are estimating that these things happen, especially in the social sciences. And then the research comes out, either backs it up or doesn't back it up. So I, I think there's social science research is hard. And it's usually after the fact, after we've started writing articles about it empirical science that you know you can measure even that is called into question so those red wine studies are difficult because you'll have an article or you'll have a a study come out one year that says this and then another one that says that and i think another thing that's hard for journalists reporting on science is they don't understand science they don't understand how studies should be written and i i think in, in like, they don't understand the difference between a control group or maybe an overview study. Which is my Those fault are, in journalism school that we don't right. teach them. Yeah, we got to do that. Let me give you a few but, facts from, from Bruns. Our study, let me give you a few studies, let's say, right? So, so uh, two studies looked at already divisive topics like abortion, vaccination, Obamacare, gun control, and found, of course, they're divisive online. Then they looked at other topics that people argue about, like Game of Thrones and food porn, and found that they didn't lead to, to, to polarization online. So is the problem that online creates the divisiveness or that we just bring the divisiveness online? Another one, social media users, I'm quoting here, generally encounter a greater diversity of news sources than non-users do. So that's the echo chamber argument. Oh no, we're just in our filter bubble. We don't know crap. Another one, those users frequenting the most extremely partisan conservative sites in the United States have been found also to be more likely than ordinary internet users to visit the New York Times. Mm. Uh, another one, exposure to highly partisan political information, I'm again quoting, does not come at the expense of contact with other viewpoints. These are things that are not hard to find. And I, I will confess here that I'm very ashamed of myself that I never learned, no one ever taught me in journalism school, no one ever taught me in a newsroom ever to go and do a search of academic research to find out what facts were. And yeah, we didn't have Google Scholar before. We didn't have JSTOR. We didn't have other things. But I'm saying now that it, the next time I see a, a journalist do the, the lazy filter bubble story, I'm on their rear end. Uh, I have to say, though, there's two things at, at work here. First of all, the reason people believe in the filter bubble is because it makes sense to them. Yeah. So it's one of, and I think this, we do this all the time. We don't look for studies or facts it just, oh, that makes sense. Same same with the vaccination story. It, it makes to sense. To some people, it makes yeah, sense. kind of makes sense. And then the, this is, and it's hard for a journalist because if, you can, if you're constantly saying, well, wait a minute, but let's look at the facts. What makes sense to you is wrong. You end up sounding like, uh, you know, you're harping. You sound, I don't think you'll be a popular journalist for very long. And so there, this has to be done. As Bernie Sanders would say, 
<laughs> well, no, nobody likes Bernie either. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's a problem, and it's a problem. Journalists are, yes, of course, you know, it's a higher calling and all that, but ultimately, it's a business. But that doesn't mean that, that you doesn't need mean to, you then say you, you need to go build with... an audience, and if the audience gets angry because every time you every time you come on, you say something that bursts their bubble. So we should go with the falsity. Screw it. Well, no, okay, but you well, have to I'm do it gonna... carefully. <laughs> Here's, here's an easier and reputation. You can't do it every time. Okay. As a journalist, as, as both a newsroom journalist who had only one story due every day. God, you remember being a daily journalist and people were like, that's so hard because you have to write a story every day. Yeah, you could read the newspaper uh, in the morning. It was amazing. <laughs> oh, crazy. But now, in, in being a blogger who's had a story and, and even occasionally only having to do it one story a week, which is crazy. Um, academic papers suck. They're hard to read. They're hard to understand. They're expensive to find and access, even and with can, things like Google Scholar. And you can even and, find studies that completely contradict one another almost and, every time. Yes, of course. Yes. And you it's and in the world of academia, it's hard to know who's legit and who isn't. So I have to quote right. academic sources every now and then for some of my articles. Mm -hmm. And if you get the wrong academic, Everyone else in the academic circles are laughing at you, and they're like, yeah. and they'll come out of the woodworks. They're not just laughing at you; they're usually telling you what an idiot you are. Um, and you also have to deal with people who think that their minor disagreements really matter. When to the bigger picture and world at large, you're like, eh, it doesn't. Through that. So, and that's. That's asking a lot of someone who's not paid very much and who is also trying to juggle a lot of other things. That's that's. But my... as a journalism teacher, I I think that. Um, well, you should always hold the highest standard. Yeah, you yeah, should. And I realize I'm realizing that, that I'm not. You know, yes, the head of research that our school teaches this, but I haven't been teaching this, and I need to. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right, but I think you also have to address the the. the real politic of it all which is you can't be the guy who's always bursting people's bubbles but you don't but you don't back you up the bubble when the bubble is don't BS. back up the bubble don't back up the bubble don't back that up that would bubble. be a show title but we we've <laughs> far beat it uh let's see let's take a break and come back with our change log we've got picks of the week still to come as well and we do want to wrap this up in the next uh, 15 minutes no, so that fine. Fine, you can get to the debate. We're fine. We got we got we got a half an hour. We're okay. <laughs> okay. I know you're trying to get rid of me, but I am. you're stuck with me, yeah. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Cap Terra. If you're in business, uh, it's so common. It's almost universal. In fact, I just read a study we were talking about on Windows Weekly this morning. One third of all businesses are still running at least one Windows XP machine. Of course they are. And I can almost promise you the reason they run that Windows XP machine is because that critical, super important line of business program that they got written back in 1992 will only run on Windows XP, and they're stuck with it. That's why people still use Internet Explorer 8, still use Flash, Active Desktop. But really, honestly, there is great software, modern software, better software out there if you could only find it and that's where our sponsor really is helpful captera captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best modern software for your business it's and by the way i think if you've done this you know that well the first thought maybe is google it no that's not because that's just a bunch of results that are going to be all over the place ask a friend but he is not going to know every the Captera is amazing. Captera is a search engine, in effect, with 700 categories of business software and everything. I mean, from project management to email marketing, customer relation management, uh, mailing list management, but also line of business software, jail management software. You found a good one. You got to manage a jail jail tracker actually it doesn't have to be jail tracker could be e-logger could be it turns out there are half a dozen maybe more offender management system jail management programs out there well that's amazing first in custody <laughs> first of all now we know there's some but what here what's great is you can then narrow it down by uh the number of stars it's got uh by how it delivers itself is it a local you put it on your hard drive or is it a, 
uh, a web-based solution, how many seats it supports, whether, you know, it, it can make appointments, all the different features you might want. Narrow it down. You can compare side-by-side -side up to four, but then the best part, I'm kind of amazed that there's this many jail management programs out there. Then the best part is you can read the reviews. There are almost a million verified real reviews by real users on Capterra.com. This is incredible. There's a thousand new reviews every single day. So that means in the next, I don't know, three weeks, they're going to get over a million. And that's fantastic. That means you're not only going to find the right software, you're going to see what people who are using it right now say about it. Unbiased, real reviews from real people. This is such a great service. Capterra.com. Go there right now. Capterra.com slash twig. To find the tools you need to make an informed decision, get the best software for your business. Stop using Windows XP. Start using something modern. And and I got to say it again, it's kind of hard to believe. It's absolutely free. You know, the only thing I would say, if you if you do use some software, buy some software that or, or, or you know install some software that you saw on Captera, after you use it for a while, leave a review. Add to the valuable database that's Captera.com. That's it. That's the only only payment. And they don't even require that. Capterra.com slash twig, the number one free resource for finding the software you need for your business. Capterra is software selection simplified. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A, Capterra.com slash twig. Please use that uh, address because then they'll know you saw it here. And then we get credit for that. And we, and we thank you, Capterra, for being such a great supporter of this week in Google. Uh, are you excited? Are you interested uh, in this uh, T-Mobile Sprint uh, merger? It looks like it might be going forward. There's still a few hurdles, but... Why not? I think what's really interesting, and I mentioned this uh, on Twitter, is Charlie Ergen. Mm-hmm. The the he is quite <laughs> a character. A He's the founder mm -hmm. of Dish. Dish is the big beneficiary on this because right. Dish... So Charlie is a very interesting fella. A great profile about him in the Wall Street Journal. I've met Charlie. I've done his show, Charlie Chat, uh, on uh, Dish. Um, he was a poker professional poker player for many years. Uh, then an analyst at Frito-Lay. He decided to quit his job at Frito-Lay, joined with another poker player friend. They ponied up $60,000 to so start a business selling big satellite dishes, the 10-meter dishes in... Uh, Denver. Eventually, he founded the Dish Network, selling those hubcap-sized uh, dishes, going right up against the cable TV business and winning. Uh, that $60,000 investment is now worth $9 billion. That's his stake in the Dish Network. But one thing Charlie's been doing, he's, so he's a really interesting fella. He's kind of a character. But one thing he's been doing is buying up Spectrum and not using yes. it. Much to the he dismay of T-Mobile, Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, and the FCC, he's been collecting Spectrum. He has been the biggest Spectrum speculator out there for the longest time and one of the more litigious. Yeah. Um, he's, so he's buy Stacey, he's buying it, uh, holding on to it, and it sits there as a dead asset. Yes, although he would argue that he is using it or he has always had plans to use it and various things keep getting in the way. Ah. So... He comes Everybody up with knew it. that Dish was going to do this at some point, right? Yes. And, you know, he he's in a really interesting space because right now with 5G, so having access to both dishes on people's homes and millimeter wave spectrum, which he has, he can actually build a viable network, which is, I mean, this is exactly how AT&T and Verizon or how Verizon specifically is doing their 5G to the home network. But, but even better, and he even says this in this Wall Street Journal piece, he said, why would I build, build LTE just to have to rip it out when 5G comes along? He's been thinking yeah. all along, I'll start with 5G. Mm, I think he's actually been... He's had the spectrum and he's made some interesting spectrum trades over the years too. I think he's positioning to be in a space where he can actually offer a compelling service to compete with these guys where he doesn't have to compete against their spectrum holdings, which have been superior historically. He's also doing an MBIOT network. What's that? MBIOT, it's a, it's a standard, it's a cellular standard that sends very tiny bits of data out and you can, yeah, it's just tiny bits of data. <laughs> microchip bluetooth internet of things so 
I so a couple of things I think are interesting. Yes, he may have just been he may come out as one of as like he was accidentally smart, right? It may be he didn't have this strategy. No, no, he I think he know. was very I very think smart. he knew what he was doing, but you can't. Yeah, be I think sure. he was very smart. I think he I, reminds me a little of Elon Musk, maybe Jeff Bezos is one of those guys who's willing to take the long shot. I think this I think he's a uh, he's Malone a poker too. player. Yeah. He's pushed All his these chips. cable guys are poker players. They're poker players. And I think he knew he was taking a big so, risk. So he's did taking you a huge yet? risk. They say he says it's going to cost him 10 billion dollars to build this network. This is not Did you explain yet uh, how this comes out of the uh, Verizon deal? What he gets out of uh, the Sprint T-Mobile. Yeah. So in order Sorry. to this so this is what's fascinating and this is from the Wall Street Journal piece. He's sitting there Sitting on all these assets, just sitting. And all of a sudden, John Ledger at T-Mobile is told by the Department of Justice, we're not going to let this go through unless you can somehow figure out a way to create a credible fourth carrier. John Ledger goes, how am I going to do that? Thinks of Charlie. Know? He says, he calls up Charlie within, they made this deal in three weeks. Wow. And yeah. Charlie's going to get uh, the... Uh, uh, Sprint PCS uh, MVNO business, which is Metro PCS. He's going to get T-Mobile's Boost, another MVNO style, although it's owned by those companies. So part of the reason he needs that is because he has a deal that he has to be up and running as a wireless carrier by next year. So he is. Whoa. They just give him they these, these him. businesses. Yep. It may not be a very good business. It may not be a very big business, but he's satisfied the requirement. Uh, and, and so that gives him a little breathing room so that he can then start building this $10 billion 5G network. You know what? He could fail miserably. He knows he could fail miserably. This could be the a huge gamble, and he and he pushes in all his chips, and he has to walk so away So what from else the table. did he get from T-Mobile? He got a lot of spectrum, but uh, uh, I don't know if it's valuable spectrum. Maybe Stacy knows that uh, better than uh, I do. Um, um, I, I'm looking at their current or the current spectrum holdings before the acquisition. I can go look. I haven't seen their Essentially, this was mandated by the Department of Justice. They said, look, you've got, in order to approve this merger, you've got to create a credible uh, fourth, fourth carrier. And, and this was actually a very clever way to do it. Under the merger, DISH will rent capacity from T-Mobile, from the new T-Mobile, which is the combined. Which, by the way, is who'd be run by whom? By, by T-Mobile. No, by which CEO? Ledger. Ledger, good. Yeah, Sprint's out of the... Now, I don't know what happens to SoftBank's investment in Sprint. I guess they probably still have a piece of the combined the companies. Combined. Deutsche Telekom owns a big piece of, if not all, of T-Mobile. So these are actually... Don't think, even though these companies were struggling, especially Sprint, that they are not well-funded. They've got SoftBank right, behind them. Right, They've got Deutsche Telekom. After seven years of using T-Mobile's capacity, Dish will now run its own network using all that spectrum he's been acquiring and its own equipment installed on fewer towers. So uh, it's a very interesting play. I think, Charlie, I love watching people like Elon Musk, as crazy as they are, because they're willing to play at a level, a mm -hmm. Wild West level, mm -hmm. that most corporate CEOs in America just aren't willing to do. And it's and you know what, Elon wants to put twelve thousand low Earth orbit satellites up to create global internet at gigabit internet. I also love it when when the, when the third mm. point when Ledger um, goes after his competitors and pokes them. Well, and that's so why we needed somebody because yes. Charlie's the new John Ledger. So right. if it weren't for T-Mobile, I don't think I don't think we'd oh. have the deals we have from Verizon and, and yes. AT&T by any means. Yeah. So okay. So it's actually. Dish is actually going to get part of Sprint's 800 megahertz spectrum, oh, which is juicy. awesome. Juicy, juicy. And yeah. Dish already has 600 and 700 oh. megahertz spectrum. Yeah. So they have really, so who cares about 5G and their stupid millimeter wave? It's got stuff that is going to. Yeah, these low freak, relatively go low walls. frequencies go through walls. And that's really what's key. These are the old TV spectrum. That, that remember yes. that when the digital moved to digital, they had to give up those 700 megahertz spectrum. That's what he has. So that is, yeah, that's going to be a better cell phone service than these other guys can well, is, offer. Is it cell phone or is it data or what? Well, is it's it? all. I don't. I doubt they're very That'll much. That'll be data. It'll all be data. It'll they're be not going to do. Well, but okay. So he can't do massive amounts of data because I think he's only got a 20 megahertz total in that band, which 
in your so the width of your channels is what allows you what is the limiting factor on how many bits per hertz you can well and the other thing charlie's i think can, charlie's betting on is that remember we were talking about how hard these giant corporate mergers are when you have two different cultures you have two different technologies mm -hmm. I think he's betting that T-Mobile is going to be struggling integrating Sprint's customers, Sprint's network into their network. Stores. It's the store is going to be a mess. And I think he's saying to himself, that gives me a decade to build out something better. He also says he wants to disintermediate the phone companies. He says, you know, he says that... Uh, their networks. Yeah, everybody wants to disintermediate the yeah. phone companies. Well, of course, <laughs> but but he's in that business now. He uh, he says um, he's starting from behind in the cell phone game, but he argues it gives him an advantage. Their legacy is a mishmash. Their networks are plaid. We will be a solid color. <laughs> you gotta like this guy. He also says he sees some opportunity with car companies offering five G yes, to yes. self driving cars. He's going to target those businesses. Does this affect he says, his, dish, his core dish business? Pardon me? Does it affect his core dish business? Does he does he deliver? I think it integrates with his core business, right? Uh, the, those those dishes can be used. Can they be used? Are they the right frequencies? I think you they are. you don't need to. So those dish. So your satellite dishes. If given the spectrum he owns, he doesn't need to worry about that. Okay. He doesn't. Need so he'll be like fine that. having. He does he also, have to have space on towers, which that's going to be tricky, money. right? That's where the ten billion dollars comes in. I would imagine. He also says he wants to offer something called on-demand pricing, charging less in the middle of the night. I think what Charlie's looking at is a B two B business, not not so much the consumer business with B two B. And there's a whole yeah. So Dish and Twilio and oh gosh, even Arm is getting into this. There is a whole business right now to be had in saying, "I'm going to give you internet access for your things." Again, it's yeah, IoT, right? And it's right. because a company like BMW, for example, doesn't want to have to do deals with AT and T and Verizon and Deutsche Telekom and everybody. They want one one throat to choke, basically, and they want to have. SLAs that work for them when they're talking to their customer. Yeah. And that's it's going to be a huge business. The carriers know it. Everybody knows it. Everybody's trying really hard. And we'll see who wins. Uh, it's just a fascinating story. Great piece in the Wall Street Journal about uh, Charlie Ergen. Uh, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun over the next decade watching this play out. Now, is this bad for consumers? Losing, uh, two, you know, combining two into one. Yes, yes, because T-Mobile has gotten better. Sprint has kind of failed. Um, I feel like we, we would have lost Sprint anyway. Yeah, we kind of have. I mean, who's who's on Sprint today? Right. I right. feel like them together will be better at fighting AT&T yeah. and Verizon. That's kind of my That's thought. Than, yep. than yep. they were apart. That's yeah. why I've been rooting for this merger. And they'll and even if their service is very good, as Ledger did before, they'll poke them. So right. hard that we'll get better deals. Right. I'm a T-Mobile fan. I've been a John Ledger fan. And I also I also think that Charlie wants to take over the role of the industry iconoclast and the poker. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Charlie's a really good person to do that. He'll be the Craig McCaw of this, this decade? Yeah. Craig McCaw's a yeah. great yeah. analogy. He was the guy who created oh, yeah. the cell phone business, basically. Uh, Why, I mean, wireless... I think one of my first stories for GigaOM was actually like... To be in wireless, you need to be ballsy. It's crazy because it is crazy a crazy business. So, yep, yep. We'll watch. It's not over. The uh, there are, uh, I think, a dozen state attorneys general who are still suing, saying it's anti-competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if those lawsuits will will disappear now that the DOJ has said, well, we think it's competitive if they do this, this, and this. So, um, interesting. Uh, let's do that uh, thing with the trumpets and the drums. It's time for the Google change log. The Google change log. Wait, so Karsten has to hit like four buttons to make that happen? Yeah, it's very complicated. It, we, he's got, there's a steam engine it, involved. He's got a... Is there not a macro we can have for that? <laughs> wow. Oh, no, that macro is named Karsten. <laughs> We probably could automate it, but I don't. I, I like watching him it was, scramble. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a scramble. You, you really, finally it was, got to see I this. enjoy that, too. 
It's like an <laughs> octopus. It's like, ah, 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 ah. I didn't think you did the No, he's actually now. using gesture control. <laughs> That's if what we only. need. We need gesture control. <laughs> All Google. right, so we need we need a way to punch Leo, and we need a way to make Karsten's <laughs> life less miserable. All you, right. You've got me here today. Uh-oh. Oh. So that means you got to be nice have, to me. Have you had any yeah. reason to want to punch me to this point? <laughs> no, not today. Thank goodness, but, sweetie. Like, oh, ah. yeah. <laughs> ah. Ooh, he punches good. <laughs> Google Chrome 76 is here, and it does a number of interesting things, including block, flash. It also has an interesting feature that uh, paywalls won't like. Uh, it turns out in Chrome, you know, they have this incognito mode, but a lot of sites have figured out a way to bypass incognito or to re second recognize you're in incognito and then come after you and, and say, say ah, you can't yeah there are a number of sites ah, that will say no incognito visits because we don't get any information about you so google has reestablished the power of the incognito mode we go back to flash for a second so when i try to watch msnbc i've got to go through this whole magilla every time where i have to uh, say it's okay to do Flash like three times. MSNBC uses Flash? Okay, well, they need to fix that. That's really yeah. what this will do. That's uh, what I'm hoping for. Nobody yes. will be able to see it. I mean, Let Flash... Me uh, yeah. Ironically, though, when I want to do Google Hangouts, if I want to take a picture of me, I have to enable Flash. Really? Which is, yeah, so like, you know how, in, and maybe this won't happen for much longer, wow. but... There's an option for you to take a picture of what you're doing right now. <laughs> Look at this on, on MSNBC. No flash detected. Adobe Flash is required to watch our live video. Please visit adobe.com to activate Adobe Flash in five easy steps. <laughs> <laughs> Which never five wow. easy steps. And by the way, I'm on a Chromebook, so it won't work. It won't work. Right. And so then it tries to go in here and tell me to do it there. Then I've got to do it so up here. So that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's absolutely no reason in this day and age why any website should be streaming via Flash. Did you hear that? Well, so, see, I know you're watching. Did you hear that? But why, why does Google use it for Hangouts? Go to Google Hangouts and click the little attach a photo thing. And if you use your web camera, boom. Really? Really? You get the same message. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. That's weird. Just to make sure. Huh. Don't know. So, Go, yeah, I'm Google. like, no, no. I mean, Google granted, better fix that, Google. Di different teams, but still, I'm like, it's so baffling. Hmm. 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 Okay, sorry. I, I we were know. actually I doing a change log. about that. Uh, the reason you might want to use incognito mode is to bypass that counter that says you've already had your five free. Right. And so if, you, if they're not saving a cookie, they wouldn't know that. Which, by the way... The counters lie regularly. There are sites that I have never gone no. to in life. You go to and it says, oh, you've already seen your three articles. It works, though, because I've ended up paying for Bloomberg, which I really didn't want to do because oh, that's wow. 35 bucks a month. I've ended up paying for Wired. I, I was willing to do 35 that. bucks a month? Bloomberg really rakes you over the coals. But, I mean, it's a business expense. It's a yeah. necessity. And so, you know, I do it. But, geez, I hate. If every website charged 35 bucks a month, I'd be, I'd be broke. I mean, we use so many different websites. Anyway, uh, Google has fixed that incognito mode. Being you, how detectable. do you define fix, Mr. President? Now you can go to the Boston Globe or the New York Times and read as many articles okay, as you fine. want. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, it, it doesn't. It it doesn't. It doesn't tell people you're using incognito. That was right. the problem, and it's been doing that for years. And so, stop it, Google. You know, I will show you, you another a, a useful tip if you want to know a useful tip. Um, remember I was talking uh, last week or two weeks ago about start using startpage.com. If you, if you, on the start page site, I'm going to go search for New York Times. Remember, these are Google search results. So it's going to give me the same results I would get on every link. And I sh should have mentioned this. There is a, every search result, Whoa. there's an anonymous view. If I click that, uh, it goes through a uh, kind of a tour style an anonymizer that means it's all reset. So I don't use this because I pay for the New York Times. I don't use this to bypass, you know, any paywalls. But it does. That is a very nice way if you want to go to a site and not have them know anything about you. Actually, I can demonstrate that. By the way, that's the creepiest technology story. Oh, the Epstein story. He wanted to freeze his head in his 
He wanted organs. to spread his DNA through men. He mankind. wanted to impregnate 20 women with his sperm and Insane. host Insane. them at a ranch. Insane. I'm oh. going back to the change log. So, <laughs> so uh, my fault. Anyway, I'll show you if I go right now to a site like who or not net, which tells you what your IP address is, what your browser is, who your ISP is. If I do that from the start page search, it knows a lot of stuff about me. But if I click the anonymous view from here, it, it's like Tor. It thinks I'm from some other spot. It thinks I'm in West Hills, United States, using Hurricane Electric. I'm on Linux. I'm not. Jeez. So this is really a useful tool for completely anonymizing yourself. Better than incognito mode if you want to go to a site and you want to go You've just incognito. bankrupted the news business. Thank you very much. You're very you know, welcome. Hurricane, Hurricane Electric is a, is a hot potato uh, routing site, so it's right. not an actual ISP. But if you wanted to, you could look at that and say, oh, they're using Hurricane Electric. That's not legit. Don't and let them anyway. in. Yeah, I guess they can. Yeah. Well, Sorry. when they do that, we'll, uh, we'll do something else. Uh, if you are interested in Google's Titan security keys, I honestly think there are other solutions just as good. I'm a YubiKey fan. But if you want to get your security keys from Google, you can now not only in the U.S., but in Canada, Japan, France, and the U.K. And I guess because it's from Google and all of that. But you can use Google's uh, super security system without having their particular keys. Um, so, yeah, I actually, they had problems with the Titan security keys, so I'm not a huge. Now, what are you saying? I saw the next story. Android Auto's first big refresh since debuting is starting to roll out with Jeff Jarvis's very favorite feature, dark mode. Now, dark mode by your, default, but it's good in your car. By no, it's not. It's so much better in your car. You don't no, want to it's bright. not. You know I'm going what? over no. the bridge and I'm in a panic because it's all dark. No, but it's you. <laughs> You're, it's, you're going actually, over the bridge at night and you can't see anything. Well, actually, because I it's turn so it off right I, in your car. I. You want the truth? I turn off ways when going over the bridge because I don't want to see all the blue. The blue, the water around yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, this is a redesigned Android Auto. I do not have a car with Android Auto. I wish I... Actually, I do, but I don't get to drive it. That's the, the Chevy Bolt. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I still drive a, a, a car from, oh my God, 2016. <laughs> it feels so antiquated. It's funny how technologies move so yeah. fast that a car's... Uh, informatics from 2015 or 2016 seems out of date, but it does. I wish I had well, Android Auto. And think about it this way: the car that is being sold today, their informatics were developed and built and well, implemented yeah. in like 2015. Yeah, that's <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, that's it's why. Not, I mean, oh, there's no Tesla's pretty, pretty good. You have a Tesla, Stacy. That's they've done a good job of keeping it up to date. That's. You know, I I gave up my Tesla. The lease ran out, so that's why I'm kind of suffering. Yeah, I came bit. in the parking lot here. And I thought, oh no, Leo's not here. Oh yeah, and no, I don't, don't look for my car. So I love this story from the information. Uh, Google uh, has many OEM partners for its uh, smart speakers. One of them was Huawei. <laughs> uh, they were going to do a, a speaker that would come out this fall at the IFA trade show in Berlin. A smart speaker that's listening to you all the yeah. time. Yeah, actually, in a way, that's kind of probably a good idea yeah. not to do a Huawei Google smart speaker. <laughs> when can we get the new Nest uh, Hub Max? I want to get that. September 9th. Is, well, that's when you can order it. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to ship I the same day. I want to get that. I like, I like the looks of that. Aren't you going to wait for the one with Project Soli in it? Oh, will there be? I guess there would. Then well, it could, if, if you believe me, then Then it could then see yes. everything in 3D. Then it house. could it could read hey, your gestures. I, I had that. Uh, remember the advertiser that had the what was it? Lighthouse, Lighthouse had the three Lighthouse uh, time, of, the flight time of flight sensor, flight yeah. sensor, and all that stuff. So I'm not, you know, I'm not shy. I don't mind. Well, that was an actual camera. Yeah, and and the and sensor. a time of flight sensor. So you couldn't you couldn't fool the camera with weird like cutouts of people moving around. Yeah, <laughs> that actually, was pretty cool. Didn't you fool it with a balloon, though? No, that was the one that didn't get fooled by oh, the balloon. Okay. The Nest got the Nest IQ, which is now here, got fooled by the balloon. It kept saying, "There's somebody in your house." It was Mylar balloons. <laughs> <laughs> Google is phasing out the old voice search. The old voice search getting phased out in favor of the new young assistant. Okay, fine. What's the difference to a consumer? Not much. It looks okay. different. 
Oh, then never mind. No, it doesn't. It's the same response, you know. I have John Legend now on all my Google <laughs> Assistant stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love. I it. have cyan. I believe is the color. Oh, you cyan. I like cyan a lot. Yeah, they do it by color. The voices now. That's a good tip, by the way. I th we've mentioned it before, but go into your settings and choose a color. There, uh, there are some very dramatic differences. And that, <clears throat> watch this now. Watch, watch, Karsten. And that's the Google change log. Oh, he was on it. Oh, he cheated. He was ready. Let's do the Google change log again. Jeff Jarvis. Oh, Jeff. Jeff used to be the um, critic for TV Guy. <laughs> now he's you don't use lying on the highway. Lower thirds. That's what happens. <laughs> he used to be the critic for TV Guide. So. Did uh, did Howard Stern pick up on that former TV guy critic? Uh, Lowell no, Third? no, 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 no. no, no. Just, All right. That's well. That's that's how he knows me because that's I wrote how he about knows him. you. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's how that all started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I gave him a, I gave him a good review, and he offered to do unspeakable things to me. Jeff Jeff has been a a, a former TV guide critic for a long a time. long a very long time long mm -hmm. time. Spotify's doing well. Hundred and eight million paying customers. Total monthly active user count two hundred thirty-two million. They are, Woo! yeah, yeah. I was there was it, for a while. It looked like Apple Music was coming on strong, might beat Spotify. In fact, the Wall Street Journal said it's just a matter of time. Nope, nope. Apple Music is not even close. So I am weird because I live love you to Google. I still <laughs> use Google Play Music. It's fine. What am I missing? Nothing. In fact, I'm mad at myself because I I went through a pruning. And I thought, well, I've got Apple Music, I've got Amazon Music, and I've got Google Music. I only need one of those. I'm going to keep Apple Music. I killed Google Music, and I forgot that that also was giving me YouTube Red. Right. Or YouTube Premium, as they call it now. All of a sudden, I got all these ads in my YouTube. Oh. oh that right. is worth the price of admission alone. Yeah. So that's what you're missing. So you can watch Great Elephant videos. I don't know what that's about. Cute <laughs> Elephants. You, oh. you can still watch cute elephants with ads. I yeah. just, I have ads now. I think uh, it was funny because my our teenager noticed. He said, why am I seeing all these ads on my YouTube all of a sudden? I went, oh, shoot. And oh, yeah. My daughter, oh. my, my daughter it, like, we have Hulu because we got a special, like, I don't know, a while back for 99 cents a month. Oh, nice. And it's the ad version, but I'm like, 99 yeah, cents a month. A I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. She's like. I, what are these ads? They're stupid. And I'm like, oh yeah, ads are really bad. <laughs> she has not seen commercial television, has she? She is. I mean, <laughs> why we, do they keep playing had... the same ad, mommy? Yeah, she's like these, the, like the Liberty it's Mutual the Captain... ones. Oh God, I hate that emu. That freaking it's... emu. That's the oh, worst. Oh, I, I do too. The lemu, I emu. do too. And but... I, you know what? I actually looked up. I was worried that there was animal abuse. No, it's a. CGI. They say it's animatronic. Yeah, it's, it's a, a CGI emu. But you can't get a real emu to peck the glass over and over again. Come on, man. I was worried. It's so Insurance sad. companies are It evil. feels like Liberty Mutual wants to be Geico, but can't. <laughs> like, they just oh, don't thanks. have the... Yeah. They need a better agency. That's all I'm saying. Uh, well, anyway. And there can only be one Geico. There can only be What's one. his name? Chuck? Chuck? The Not emu? the emu, Chuck? but the guy. The guy. Yeah. Oh. Lemu and Chuck. Terrible. It's awful. 70s cop show parody that just doesn't ring true at all. Uh, and then there's Captain Obvious. Did, yeah. Does Hulu stopped with that? Because they were running a Captain Obvious ad every break. Every break for Hotels.com. It was oh, getting uh, no. so tiring. They uh, needed some we, more ads, that's all. I'm a fire. We, we may be in a different... Sorry. Oh, go on. YouTube Premium is $11.99 a month. I am such an idiot. I canceled... Because I was I was grandfathered in at the eight dollars a month for YouTube. Oh, for see, this Music. is what you get for all this giving things I'm up. And, an oh, I'm going to quit. I'm I'm finished. Oh, ah. what was I thinking? Yeah, well, you see what you do to yourself. See, I wonder if I can go see? back. I wonder if I say, Google, "Hey, I'm will sorry. you forgive me? Please forgive me, you Google." Wouldn't that, that would be nice if they have said, "Well, yeah, okay, you can get back in at your grandfathered." Yeah, price. that's not going to happen. No. They've been just waiting for me, right? Like, I'm sorry, Leo. They've been waiting for me to do that. Subscribe. Mm -hmm. Let me just see how much it costs. Because don't you still get YouTube Premium when you subscribe to Google Music? 
I think so, yeah. Yeah. Or vice versa. Depends on how you look at it. I should probably just resubscribe. It's $15 a month now for the family plan. Cool. <sighs> well, I like Google Music. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we oh, should wrap this up. I think we've gone through... Do you have a story I've missed? I was just going to ask about the fi limits, which some people have brought up because they're upset. Are but there limits on your fi? You can only have four sims now, not... D data, data sims. Data sims. Oh, that's too bad because I was about to order another data sim. I love the... I, I have dozens of them. Because <laughs> you only so pay for what you use. You. It does affect me. That's what people are doing. It only pays for what you use. So I was putting sims in everything. Right. My yeah. car, everything. I mm -hmm. wish I could put it in a Chromebook, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> One day, Jeff. One day. All right. It's time for Stacy and her pick of the week. And I bet you I know what it's going to be. Is it going to be the wise smart plugs? Um, You know, someone asked me about that. I can make those my pick of the week. I had something different. They've announced the pricing and, and, and pre-orders. Yeah, I have I have here. Let me pull up the thing. 15 wise. bucks a pair. That That's is a good amazing. Price. I'm going to make that my pick. All right, you do it. I just, I can't bring myself to buy more smart plugs. I have so many. You only need as many smart plugs as you have sockets. That is not true. Um, but you, you can more? still Wait, buy them. What would you do with more than you have sockets? Sorry, I mean, it's, I don't need that many because not all of my sockets are oh. You need fewer than are homes sockets. being fewer. built with smart plugs? They should be. in every. No, but homes are being built with um, USB. USB ports. I'm seeing that. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Right, because that's a cheap and easy. Well, I saw somebody on on Twitter today. A friend of mine said that he he could tell from the, the the fresh paint smell. He was in a new room, and then he saw that the USB port in the wall was USB C. <gasps> Ooh, that's uh, modern. That oh, is like this year. Living yeah. in the future. That's so 2019. Oh my God, I want. All right, so we won't mention the wise smart plugs. What is your pick? My pick of the week, and I've mentioned this before. I think I just shut down that window though, so let me go get to it. Slate does a deal with future tense and they have people write fiction stories yeah. and they're awesome fiction stories yeah. and they're all about like, Extra, it's like Black Mirror, but they're not all depressing, right? And so they're they're putting them all in an anthology. And yes, you can read all of them online for free on nice. Slate. Nice. But if you're just the type of person who just wants to have it, you know, in a book or Kindle format, it won't be available till October 2nd, but you can pre-order it now. I love this. My favorite story probably of all of them is uh, Charlie Jane Anders had this awesome one. I even wrote a response to one of them. So that's my pick of the week. You should totally read these. They're fun. You'll enjoy them. Nice. I love sci-fi. I did I did not know that you were a sci-fi fan, however. I'm a I'm a reading fan. Reading. I read everything. Mm. I read cereal boxes. Mm. <laughs> you know what? I'm on a James McWhorter pick. A kick well, you are because now because of, of you. Yeah. Uh turns out so you talked about his uh a book about the English the language. bastard language. Our bastard tongue. But uh, it turns out, remember I was telling you about the great courses I was mm -hmm. listening to? That's mm -hmm. him. Yeah. It's his great course. And then he has another book, which I found in my searches, uh, about black English, which is really good. Oh. Really good. It's only a few hours. It's a shorter book. But he talks about how it is a full-fledged language. A lot of people think it's a form of illiteracy or it's slangy. Oh. It's not. It's a full-fledged language with its own grammar and its syntax, and it's really quite interesting. It's quite fascinating. So, highly recommend that as well. James McWhorter, uh, he is a linguist. Yes, he's he's phenomenal. He's but phenomenal. what is your number, Mister Jarvis? So, um, uh, the LA Times today had a, um, a memo leaked, perhaps, mm -hmm. about how their efforts to get subscriptions are not going so well. Their oh, goal dear. was to get three hundred thousand new subscriptions this year. They have seventeen thousand. Um, oh, dear. They got more than that, but a lot of people were canceling. You know, the Times, I almost knew this because they were the, one of the only daily papers to show up in Apple's News Plus product. Yeah, they said, the, what the heck? The yeah. Wall Street Journal didn't do right. it. The New York Times didn't do it. The Washington Post didn't do it. And I think because all three of them have fairly robust digital subscription numbers, 
And I kind of read that as the Times is a little bit desperate. So Josh Benton from uh, Neiman Lab did a great post. If you go to the second chart here, Leo, the next one. Uh, he looked at 2002 print circulation versus 2019 digital subs. There are two publications where uh, the digital subs are higher than the wow, print look was. At that. New York Times uh, in 2002 had 1.1 million print. Now it has 2.7 million digital. So digital has been good for the time. Washington Post, 746,000 print in 2002, now 1.7 million. All the other papers have far Down, fewer. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you why. I think print. the Times, uh, New York Times, and the Washington Post are seen as national. National, newspapers. exactly. The right. LA Times again wants to fool itself and it thinks feels that like it's a national, local paper. but yeah. it's a great, it's a great metro paper. Yeah. So it now ha it had nine hundred sixty five thousand, almost a million print circulation in two thousand two. Now it has one hundred seventy thousand digital subs, and they want to try to get up to a million. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Uh, the Chronicle, San Francisco Chronicle had 512,000 uh, print. Now it has 57,000 digital. I think it just bodes poorly for Metro papers. Pay paywall paywalls at that level are hard to justify. Yeah. A lot of churn. So, so yeah, the internet's ruined something else. <laughs> Lavender fields and Metro dailies. Yeah. <laughs> Do we, all right, here's a question for the journalists in the house. Do we need Metro dailies or is it sufficient yes. to have oh nationals? Gosh. Oh no, no we need no. local. Um, you not only need Metro, you need like towns, super city council people. Papers. Yeah, we have the Argus Courier in Petaluma. So they cover the city council. You're right. My yeah. dean, uh, 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 Sarah Bartlett, uh, was was core in helping to start the city in New York, which is the Texas Tribune of New York. Um, Texas Tribune, which was founded by I dare not say the name again, John I, Thornton. I, he didn't. He didn't found it. He just funded it. But yes. Yeah. With well, anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so, it, but it set a model for nonprofit journalism in the country, but that's not going to solve every problem. No. Uh, there's not enough charity. There's not enough uh, patronage. Uh, patronage. Uh, but things like the city and the Texas Tribune give their content for free to media around them, so it helps bolster the journalism in the ecosystem. So that's a another model that's starting up. Um, you know, you look at something like Medium. I finally, I finally think I figured out what I, I visited with Ev, but I think I figured out what he's doing. He's trying to create kind of the YouTube of text. The YouTube way. of text. You think about that in a way. I know. It's well, there's yeah. difference because I, he's charging subscriptions and he's pushing. I have to say, I'm a little irritated with Medium because every time I go there, it says, oh, you could read more if you would just pay But for it's it. only $5 a month as opposed yeah, to Yeah, I cancel my $5 a month. Well, I and don't it, like it the also, dark patterns. It I don't pushes put my stuff content the that is old. Right. That's well, what drives me nuts. That's part of his argument, Stacey, and I don't know that I agree with it because I find it a little irritating sometimes too, but his, 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 arg his argument, not agreement, his argument is that the uh, rabid currency of the web is what led to a lot of our problems. So that he wants to, uh, when, when Medium started, he mm. didn't put a date on the page. Mm. There was no date there, which was irritated people. Mm -hmm. But now he will surface stuff from the past. And I will find things I wrote a year ago will suddenly get a comment or something. It's kind of interesting to see how that happens. Actually, that reminds it's me of a story we didn't do, which is the guy who invented retweeting. Oh. <laughs> he says, we handed a loaded weapon to four-year-olds. I thought I was going to make it safely out of here before. <laughs> Moral panic! Well, I have to admit, retweeting is one of the things that makes Twitter... No, it also brings so magnificent things. It's yeah. great. This is this is pandering to... Uh, this is this is this is what I do what like I'm the heroic for. pictures of him. Yeah, geez. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Chris Weatherall, who no longer He's works, staring at, at a Twitter. burning bush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It pissed me off. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm glad I brought it up then. Yeah, thanks. I kind of live to piss you <laughs> I off, might, Jeff. I just hope I don't crash on the bridge. No, you won't. Don't think of that. Uh, I finally figured it out. I, I, and I hope my, my palms are sweating literally at the mention of it. But I oh just goodness. try to not know where I am. I concentrate on the car ahead. Oh, I discovered that years ago. And then I sing a song. I have no idea where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, are you driving yourself or do you get a car? I can't afford a chauffeur. We would pay for a car for No, no, you. I drive it myself. I have one. Oh, okay. No, I was, the way you were, I I'll was like, I'll give you a like chit. Well, I have the car in the lot. So if you'll oh, okay. drive that. Karsten, can you drive the car to the city? Yes, he could do that. Sure. 
Um, be fun. Next time, would you please let us set no, the car for I'm you? Fine, would that I'm be fine. a better way for you to come? No, I'm fine. It's embarrassing. Before. It's embarrassing. It's not embarrassing. I can pick you up. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I trust that. Yeah, I wouldn't take a ride from Karsten if I were you. He's driving with the hand gestures. <laughs> what? Where's my horn? Where's my horn? I need the horn. <laughs> babe, babe, where's my horn? Jeff Jarvis is a professor of journalism. Well, he's not just a professor of journalism. He's the Leonard Tao Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. <gasps> Breath. At the City University of New York. And is a blogger, prolific at buzzmachine.com and a book author prolific now in paperback what would google do public parts paper. i said that on your blog that's why i said it <laughs> now in paperback uh gutenberg the geek geek sparing gifts and lots more read his books they're good we also thank Stacy Higginbotham. Stacy on iot is her website stacy on iot.com her great newsletter there read that subscribe to that it's free why wouldn't you and, of course, the IoT podcast with Kevin Toffel, a must-listen at Giga Stacy on the tweet storm, on the retweet machine. Do you hit the retweet button, Stacy? I'm pro-retweeting. I hadn't yeah. even occurred. It hadn't occurred to me that people are using it for abuse. But once it did, I was like, I tried to become more judicious about how I used it. Actually, the president used it just People this, use this ice today. cream for abuse. They use just, everything for just abuse. Just today, the president retweeted a QAnon uh, yeah. site, brought it to Twitter's attention. They banned the site. <laughs> so be careful out there. You never know what a retweet will do. We do twig. Every uh, Wednesday, about 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. You could watch live if you wanted or listen live. We have uh, live audio and video streams at twit.tv slash live. If you're doing that, join us in the chat room, irc.twit.tv. We don't get a lot of in-studio visitors because it's the middle of the week, I guess, but we, you're always welcome. If you're going to be in the Petaluma area, send us an email, uh, tickets at twit.tv. And say which shows you'd like to attend, and we'll let you know if we're doing those shows and if the studio's open. It's not always open, but it's open for this show every week. Um, and we'd love to have you. Uh, we'll put a chair out for you and all of that. If you want to download copies of the show, we also make those available on demand. Uh, because it's a podcast, after all, and that's the whole idea there. Just go to twit.tv slash twig. What is that sound? Is, is there somebody grinding stumps in your backyard, Stacy? Oh, no, that is someone, I guess, taking a shower right next door to me. <laughs> <laughs> so now we know what it sounds like in my little area when someone takes a shower next door. <laughs> okay, it's good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Sorry. It sounds I'll, I'll a little bit the, like a stump grinder. Uh, <laughs> I, I, should, I have it turned up too loud, obviously. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, subscribe. That's the best thing to do because that way you'll get the show the minute it's available. Thank you all for watching, listening, and for being here. We'll see you next time on Twig. <laughs>